Okay, we're now recording. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Discharging Criminal Cases. Um, I did this webinar because I've been getting so many um, requests from people who have loved ones who are getting locked up. In particular, there are a lot of women who have uh, young men who are getting locked up. And um, so I decided maybe to do a webinar on it so we can sit down and have a discussion and approach this topic and see exactly what can be done um, uh, in a particular situation. Okay, first I want to start out by saying that, um, that, you know, the secure party process and discharging debt process is not a get out of jail free card and is by no means a license to go out and commit crime against your fellow man. Um, most of the time, you know, what really has to be addressed is that any situation that you find yourself in, you have to realize that you are the creator of that particular situation. The predominant thoughts that you carry around with you all the time is what creates the situation that you find yourself in. You know, I am not a proponent of victim mentality. There aren't any victims. There are only people who do not take responsibility and take action and uh, uh, for their own uh uh, life, so forth. And you do that by changing the way that you think. Um, with that being said, I did want to get into some things. I've been playing a lot of Tony King this week. Um, I've, been, I've gotten some people gave sent me some emails. They didn't like the fact that I got Tony King. Some people like it. You know, and people just always seem to miss the point and things that I do. I am not, I don't, I'm not a worshiper of anyone. She said, you're aligning yourself with Tony King. I'm not aligning myself with anyone. Um, what I do is I listen to people talk and I listen to what they say. And if it lines up with what I have found out, then I will give them some credence to what they say. But I just don't blindly go around following anyone. And I put as much information out there as I can because high frequency radio is like a library. And what's going to be in the library is not just what you think should be on the shelves. There's going to be a cornucopia of information that's going to be available for everyone. So I want to, you know, just preference what we're going to talk about tonight with those statements that, you know, <laughs> excuse me, when you come over to high frequency radio, you know, I put stuff out there so you'll have access to it. I'm not trying to hide any information. You know, I remember when I was trying to learn this information and I was in jail and there were guys in jail just keeping information. You know, they had information. I just wanted it real bad. and He wouldn't give it to me. You know, I got out of jail, found that I could easily find it on the Internet. So what I did was, you know, when I got out, you know, I go, I scoured the Internet, finding information and I put it all in one spot for you. You know, it didn't cost anything. You know, it's right there for you for free. But tonight I'm gonna talk. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk in particular about GSA bonds and a cover letter that goes in and talk a little bit about uh, jail and the prison industrial complex. Okay, first of all, I want you to understand that first of all, the number one thing that you're going to be contending with when dealing with these people is the fact that they don't want anybody to know this is a debt collection, okay? They want you to believe that you are still, they are still operating some sort of real judicial system, all right? So this is what you are contending with. So you have to understand that, okay? If you're looking for an easy way out, I suggest that you ask for your money back and leave right now because that does not exist. Don't let anybody you know, fool you into that or anything like that. You are dealing with corrupt, crooked, greedy, uh, you know, all type of people, you know, who are, you know, into these type of things right here. So just don't, ex don't expect to get an easy way out. It's not easy because they're going to test you all along the way. Now it is infinitely more difficult to get somebody else out other than yourself because when you're trying to get somebody else out, there may be situations where that particular individual may need to speak for themselves. And if they don't understand this information or they're not studied up, then they could inadvertently recontract back into the system. So I want that to be known as well. You know, this is this information is for people who will read and people who want to take responsibility for their own life. If you're expecting someone else 
to do something for you that just doesn't exist, okay? It doesn't exist. All right, with that being said, does anybody have any questions or anyone in here have a loved one or somebody who is in jail or anything like that, you know? I'm going to start with this. Okay. Yeah, I have a question. Go ahead. Go ahead, brother. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, my son, my son is in jail, and I was and I was uh, went to see if we can get him out. The old lineman is saying that he needs seven signatures, and you have excellent credit, and it's a new procedure I've heard of before. It says, so uh, it says it says um, if he has seven looking, signatures. Right. He needs seven signatures in order to get him out. I never heard of that before in my life. Who 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 told you that? I mean, I don't you know, I'm not I mean well, this come from the Bells Bondsman. The Bells Bondsman. He said if he gets seven signatures he, have, he can get him out of prison. So, well, you know, he's got he's hasn't been anything like that. He just got in, you know, we're trying to get him out. Um uh, so we got a bell's bond, and, and uh, you know, this is what was told to me. We, we, they, they need seven signatures with people, with, and um, you know, then they be able to get the bond the insurance company. Well, I've and never, that, so I've, with, never you know, I've never heard anything like that. But it sounds like they need seven sureties uh, from someone um, who can, you know, because right there, he's telling you right there, it's all about money. It's all commerce, right. you know? so you know they're letting you know that right there. That's what they're letting you know. But it sounds like they're asking for seven sureties because that is yeah. exactly correct. Um, you know they want people who have good credit because your credit tells what kind of person that you are. As far as um, let me let me uh, let me see if I can show y'all something real quick. Why this? Why why when you said that to me, I didn't balk because. Um, it made sense on, 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 on a fundamental level. It made sense to me. And I'm going to show you why in just a second. Let me pull this uh, document out. Um, oh, I got to go to my website. But you know, I'm, I'm gonna suggest that you take that webinar because we go through all of that. I got a webinar right. where I've already discussed all that. You know, it's just like show you how to fill okay. it out. There's a webinar on it, so take that. But we are going to go over some GSA bonds today too. We're going to uh, talk about a little bit about GSA bonds today too. But um, let me find this for you. This is called clerk's practice, and what it is is it um. This is the history. This tells you the, the forms and procedures of how admiralty courts are conducted. What is going on today is that they have, these are admiralty courts. That's what they're going on today. I, you may not uh, uh, think so, but that's exactly right. I'm going to strongly suggest that you read this book. Now, I am going to do, I'm, I'm going to do, a, uh, I'm going to eventually do a show on this. Um, I've been working up to do it because it's like it can't even be done in one show. It's going to have to be like a week that I'm going to have to go through this because there are so many different words in here that, you know, you have to address. But if you understand this, if you understand this clerk's practices, what's going to happen is that you're going to see how they have updated everything. OK, they're going to they've updated all, all the stuff that we're reading about. You see in this thing. It's just that the words, you got to work through the words. They use different words and different things like that. And But it's the same thing. It's the same thing. So right now, I want to show you about this bond thing that you were just talking about. So um, he's a contempt. Uh, And inform the judge in a summary matter of the truth that is a allegation copy of his complaint, the appearance of the person who's attached. See the appearance of the person who's attached in the case of contempt. The other side, they put an attachment on you. And uh, and they talk about appearances and contempt a lot. Uh, 
Uh, these are five libels and other. Wait a minute, is this the. Uh, these are libels. Okay, this is the, uh, the form of the libel. Okay, that's not. This is how you write your. Um, this is going into pleadings, so I went too far. Just a second. Okay, so yeah, part two right here. This is what I want right here. This right here, part two, gives you all the different titles. They have it broken down just like titles today. See, they have title one, you know, they break it down. It's, now you see where they got all this from. They have title one, they have title two. They still do this, they still do that same thing today. They call them titles. Look, title two, the direction of the warrant, manner of executing the warrant. Uh, you have a cause of, uh, of the caution or bail to be given by the person who's arrested for his legal appearance. All right. Securities or cautions as they are termed by civilians are of three sorts. These are different kind of bonds right here. These are different. These are bonds. What they call them cautions. Okay. And the execution of the warrant, uh, proxy, pure curatory, ad lights. Let's see. Let's talk about how these are talking about your attorneys. And let's see. And this is important because this is why I'm appealing to judge. I want y'all to see this. Pretends it to a personal state. Is above go. They talk about putting liens on you to petition on plaintiff's property at the time of the warrant. I exhibit my proxy. Let's see. Look at this. Then the judge shall order the defendant to be thrice called upon his stipulation by the marshal of the court. Notice, see that three times we keep talking about that how they th do things three times. All right. That comes from back in Admiralty too. Um. Okay, we play KPS. There's a KPS warrants right there. Um, contumacy, when you see this word right here, that's contempt. When they start accusing you of contempt. Fetus usury, those are sureties. See, the defendant ought to find at least two fetus usuries who should be bound respectively to the plaintiff and the sum of which the action was instituted to these effects, namely to abide the sentence to pay cost and to ratify the acts of the proctor by him constituted or to be constituted. All right, so right here, this is very important. You need to have at least two fetus usuries. This is where your form uh, 24, 25, and 25A come in. The 24 is the bid bond, the payment bond, and the performance bond are your two fetus usuries. All right, now, uh, let me go down here. And plaintiff also has to have them. And I want you to, I'm, I'm trying to show y'all what a flight risk is and why, uh, what a flight risk really is. What are, cause this is a, uh, I should have. Um, these are these are evidence. This was was what constitutes evidence, which is real good. And that was real. That, that was that right there helped me tremendously. Um, authenticated copies of documents. Give me just a second. I'm gonna roll up on it. In just a second. Introduce any person.
I accuse contumacy. The marshal is made public where I pray that he may be pre contumacious. The same if he is usually note the principal party. Uh, instant courts of Let me stop. All right, y'all found it right here on page 62. Y'all write this down. You see this right here, it says, if the def defendant be suspected of flight. Now, what do y'all think a flight risk is? All right, I'm gonna give y'all opportunity and I'm gonna turn this off. I want people to just tell me what, what it, normally under normal circumstances, somebody come on right now and tell me what they think a flight risk is. Somebody who's suspected of flight. Somebody that's trying to evade court. Brother, is it is it where uh one doesn't pay pay their debt? Well so somebody's gonna run, run on Yeah. They're not uh, they're gonna have to go honor. Somebody's on somebody who they feel like is gonna run. All right, if that's what norm I'm asking normally under normal circumstances, okay? That's what they got everybody thinking when they say you're a flight risk, all right? And then they deny you bail, and then they hold you in jail. Am I correct? And when everybody under the Constitution is supposed to be afforded, not here in Georgia, you got right to having bond two times, at least two times. All right, so let's read this. This is, okay, practice, of, this is an admiralty. If the defendant be suspected of flight, that is to say, now notice it is, that is to say, he's telling you right here, this uh, semicolon is telling you what this means, what flight means. That is to say, if he does not possess sufficient real or personal property, otherwise not. If he be suspected of embezzlement, and he is said to be so suspected if his shop remains shut contrary to custom if at any time he play at unlawful games what is that gambling if he borrow money upon usurious interest if you got a lot of loans and stuff out there with high interest rates if he do not possess real property equal to the debt if he conceal his personal property in secret places once it can be easily removed, when you move your stuff offshore, you got offshore bank accounts, or maybe you don't have stuff in your name. Once it can be easily removed, if he be involved in diverse fetus usury securities, if you're uh, if you're a surety for other debts, if he have played the light trick before, that's what your credit report is going to show. Have you done this before? If he here to two, he has been backward in paying his debts and have at present numerous creditors who are impertinent. Well, imper impertinate means that they are aggressively pursuing trying to get you to pay the debt. Very aggressive. All right. Now, that's a flight risk. All right. All these, you know, these could be, you know, a flight. Uh, 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 that you could be a flight or embezzlement in some form. But you see right here, if you don't have sufficient real or personal property, okay, they want uh, or they want some sort of, they, they're looking at your credit and so forth. They, then today, that's what they do. They do a run a credit report on you. So when you said that to me about they want uh, seven, you know, seven, uh, signatures what that said to me well, the only thing i could see is they want seven sure and they said people with good credit is that what you said people with good credit yes i mean yeah i mean that 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 sounds exactly like what's being talked about here this this document, I can't speak enough about clerk's practice, how it it basically tells you everything that they're doing. I mean, it's just it's beyond the scope of what we want to talk about today. But I wanted you to see that, 
You know, it talks about everything, flight. It talks about putting attachment liens on people. Um, I mean, it's just everything that's in here that what you're doing, it talks about absconding debtors. And I did this. I was in court, and uh, they denied me bond. And I was in court, and I went to the judge. I went to the judge. And I was in court. I said, I said, John, I said, uh, I said, why you ain't gave me a bond? I said, I'm entitled to a bond. You can't deny me a bond. Why well, don't have a bond? So, um, you know, so, you know, I said, I said, you don't have any record of me ever missing a court date. Um, I, I said, I've never um, ran or anything like that. And then he was just looking at me. And then I said, and I'm not an absconding debtor. When I said that, everybody in the courtroom almost fell out. Because I just snuck it up on. I said, yeah, I'm not an absconding debtor either. He was like, he got nerve. Everybody was like, wow, you know, is a how did he know that? It was a how did he know that? And I found out from here. Its object is to compel the appearance of an absconding debtor. And in the case, he does not appear to satisfy the debt out of his effects and credits. So what they are looking to do is notice his effects and what? Credits. A respectable writer informs that this process has gone into disuse in the courts of Admiralty of England and Ireland. The reason of it is that the jurisdiction of these courts, in instance, causes have been such narrowed by prohibitions that with the exception suits, and we'll have to pay attention to this now because they brought it back. They basically said, well, they're not doing this anymore. Well, in England, they weren't. And they're doing it. It's alive and well. So before I go further into this, I had had a plan on how I wanted to proceed today. The first thing I'm going to do is we're going to talk about a letter to the judge. You got somebody in jail that you need to get them out. All right. So the person who said their son is in jail, are you there? Are, are you on? Are you on? Yes, I'm here. You, sir. Okay. What, what state are you in? I'm in Jersey. New Jersey, okay. It's Johnny, you brother venture in some way. Is it in Superior Court or what court is it in? It's not in any court yet. He's just, you know, what I'm saying, just, 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 it's just happened like uh, uh, about three months ago, and then he's just starting to, uh, you know, get himself together as far as getting out. Okay. All right, so it just happened. Yes. All right, so he's going to have, I don't know how New Jersey is there, but let me see if I can find. Um, you know, I'm going to do it like this. I'm going to just do it like this because I don't know what y'all's pleading is like. Let me see, pleadings. But you can find this out by going to the law library. General rules of pleading. These are rules of pleading. You need to know requirements for first pleadings, case information statement of appendix XBL1, civil action general, or appendix foreclosure action shall be annexed to a cover sheet. Um, claim for relief, answer defense. So right here it tells you how the pleadings have to be. Pleading special matters. Let me copy all this so I don't have to keep coming back to it so the first thing I do is I go and look at the pleadings what the rules are about pleadings and I usually read that and have that information that's what I usually look at first I do that's how I do it because I look at how how am I going to start putting documents in okay and I want to look and see what their captions look like but in this case, I'm gonna use I'm gonna use a federal caption. So I'm going to in the United States District Court. Uh, actually, let me let me stop that. Let me let me do it like this. Go to file new. This is Word. Put in pleading. And a joint petition for divorce sample. Let me use this one right here. All right. So I'm going to put the court's name.
This is how we do it in Atlanta. All right? If it's on federal court, if it's on the federal level, this is how the federal pleading looks in Atlanta. You need to find out what it looks like in your area, but this is how it looks here. It's different in every area, in every in every place. It's basically the same thing. I'm sorry? Uh, basic guys is the same way. The same way, okay. The forms are laid out the same way. Uh, yeah, but it's not always in every state. Every state could be different. I mean, you know, it could be different. You put your you put your personal information up here. Oops, my hands tripping. And however you choose to, you know, address it, you know, to let them know that you're outside their jurisdiction. The case number. Is it? Oops, wait a minute, what is that? It went up there. Uh, does anybody know on a federal level what these letters mean at the end of your case? No. Y'all know what these letters right here mean? Okay, these three letters are the initials of the magistrate judge, and these three letters are the initials of the district court judge. All right. Thank you. All right, so now we're going to write these people a letter, and you're going to put it. You're gonna put this in the box. You're gonna put this in the uh, in, in the case, okay? All right. So, and the, now, why do I do it like this? We you can write you can write a letter to the judge just like this. As a matter of fact, if you are contemplating on suing anybody, like like you could write your um, your injunction letter like this and mail it to whoever you need to mail it to this lets everybody know and some attorneys do this too i actually got this from attorneys this lets everybody know that you will be filing this because the clerk will file this just like they will file a motion or anything else all right you if when you write a letter to the judge you can write it just like this if you want to write a letter to the prosecutor you can write it just like this now the what the letter that we're going to be dealing with today is going to be a a letter to the clerk because we're going to be giving the clerk some GSA bonds. Now you have somebody who is in jail that you need to get out of jail. The first thing that you always want to deal with when somebody's in jail is you want to deal with the debt. It's the same thing with a foreclosure. Okay. This is a debt collection. All right. You don't argue it. It says in the 14th amendment and that's what your straw man is a 14th amendment citizen. The public debt shall not be questioned. These statutes and codes and rules and regulations, these are nothing but um, uh, 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 statutes that have been put together to collect tax money from the citizens for this debt that allegedly is owed to these foreign creditors. That's all it is. This kind of, And you can read something called the statute merchant to get a little bit more insight on this. So the first thing you want to do is you always want to address the debt. Now, the thing is, you're giving certain notices. Now, I did a webinar called uh, Creditors and Their Bonds, where we went through the notices that you're giving to the judge. Now, what I'm about to do, show you right now, I don't really share with a lot of people, but I decided to share it uh, with uh, the group. Uh, some powerful information I usually reserve to myself, uh, but I'm going to let y'all see it too. This is a cover letter. I'm going to be going through a cover letter with you that goes to the clerk 
uh, and it's and it goes along with your um, with your uh, your GSA bonds. I'm also going to show you how to do a notice of filing today. All right, these are documents. These are how you get your stuff in the court. Just notices. So, so the first thing, some people I got called today. Some people say they they whether you're doing a bill of exchange because you don't have to use GSA bonds. You can use whatever. Now you said you we we start to let the accompanying. Uh, under notary seal. Over Yusuf, I got a question. Go ahead. What is the OP90 and OP91? Optional form 90, optional form 91. Does a release of lien from escrow and release of, uh, uh, you, you never seen those two? No, sir, but I'm assuming that the SF is standard form. Yeah, standard form and OP stands for optional form. Okay, and we're going to, I'm going to show you those forms. You're going to see those. So you're going to, you're okay, going to get a see them. Perfect, perfect. Appreciate it, brother. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm going from scratch, from beginning to end. All right. That's why I, I started with a blank piece of paper. <laughs> I don't want nobody. To, <laughs> I don't want nobody to be confused about nothing. I'm, I'm gonna show you. I'm, I'm gonna show you. How I would sit down at home with nobody uh, messing with me and how I do it for myself. <laughs> I, I know, I know you is, brother. I just wanted to make sure that. Uh, I was reading right. I appreciate it, brother. Thank you. And I'm going to do every paragraph. When I finish writing the paragraph, I'm going to explain it to you. So I'm almost through with this paragraph right here. And so we're going to go over this uh, paragraph right here. All right. Now, let's read this real quick. This is a letter, all right, that, that's going to be filed. This is a letter that's going to the clerk. It's the company GSA form, standard form 24252525A, optional form 90, optional form 91, and standard form 28, as well as the bonded, bonded bill of exchange, number 567. It's hereby presented under notary seal by prearrangement with the Treasury, with the Department of Treasury. Treasury Secretary Jacob Liu is co-payee on the instrument and a holder of the securitization bond referenced thereof on. Now, does anybody want to take a shot at deciphering what this paragraph right here means? Or do you just want me to just start explaining it? But I'm, I'm going to see, I always like to give somebody an opportunity. For instance, what does it mean right here when it says Jacob Liu is the co-payee on the instrument and holder of the securitization bond reference they're on. What does that, that, what does that mean? Anybody want to take a shot and tell me what that means? Yes. Go ahead. He's a third, he's a third party that's uh, securing uh, the, the bond that it's, it's going to be executed from. No. Anybody else? Good try, but no. 
Is he the trustee, Yusuf? Yeah, he's the trustee. We know that. But what? Let, let me read this to you again. Treasury Secretary Jacob Liu is co so he's a copayee on the instrument and a holder of the securitization bond reference. What does it mean right here when we say securitization bond reference there on? That he holds the security for the bond that Okay, when um, you do a okay, this right here and this prearrangement, okay, I'm I'm gonna go on and break it down for you. All right. The accompanying GSA forms, as well as the bonded bill of exchange, is hereby presented under notary seal. Now, we know presented under notary seal means you have a notary that's going to mail this, right? Now, the next part, the next part by prearrangement with the Department of Treasury. The prearrangement with the Department of Treasury is talking about you've already completed a secured party process. All right. So you have your bonds in, <clears throat> you sent a bond to the Treasury Department, backed by your birth certificate, all right, to Jacob Blue. So Jacob Blue is a copayee on the instrument because every time you need to discharge something, who do we go to to get the discharge of debt for? You go to the Secretary of Treasury, do you not? Yes. All right, so that makes him a copayee on the instrument. And he's the holder of the securitization bond reference thereon. The securitization bond that we're talking about is the bond that you sent to the Treasury Department. He's the holder so of the it. The birth certificate. The birth certificate, the birth yes. Certificate. Or the, the okay. yes. Okay, yes. All right. So does everybody understand that paragraph right there? Any questions, please? So you have to have finished up a, a secure party creditor uh, with this particular, package. With this particular process, I'm doing yes. However, do you have to do a secure party process? No, to to do this, you don't have to do this. However, I like to do secure party because everything is documented. Everything is is banking. It's no way around it, in my opinion. You know, it's like everything is just documented so well. And everybody's informed what's going on. So I prefer that. But I want you to, you, now you can use your imagination and uh, if you want to modify this for your particular situation without the utilization of a secure party cr process, you can. Right now, I, I teach secure party and this is what you're going to be needing to do to get out of jail because when you go through one man out, well, old boy got himself out the jail. The first thing he did was a secure party process. He started sending no birth certificate nowhere or anything like that. He started severing minimum contacts that gave them the presumption that they had jurisdiction, in personam jurisdiction over him. Number one, he's the first thing he dealt with, he dealt with that social security number. And number two, he dealt with the IRS. Because all this is tax. This is all a tax. Remember, we're dealing with taxation. Got Go ahead. I got a question, brother. So let's just say, could can you over? Let's just say you send them a bond. You send them a a bond for five hundred thousand, but the case was only for like uh, twenty thousand. Can you do an overpayment? Yeah, you know, know, and you know that's a very good question. Um, you know, I'm gonna tell you like this. Uh, I would think it would be better to leave it blank, let them fill it in, and then. Okay. You know, in some cases, we you know when you're dealing with, uh, you know, the the judges or so forth. But yeah, you can overpay them. You can write the, you can write, you can write the, uh, you put to the pay to the order of the U.S. Treasury, and then you tell them. And matter of fact, this letter is going to talk about any windfall that they uh, receive, such as overages and everything. They can utilize that for their own personal benefit. So we're going to see that in just a second. That was a very good question, though. All right, because the, the follow up to that question would be. Um, let's just say the judge, I did give him one with an amount, and then they didn't take it. And I will also have another one on it that's blank. Can I just submit both of them to him if he doesn't take the first one? Yeah, you can. Yes, you can. As a matter of fact, you should, uh, you should everything that you do in the system, you should do at least three times. The okay. Functions in threes. I got you. I got you.
I know I might be stepping ahead with this last question, and forgive me, y'all. When you're doing this, right? Right. After they, after they get the bond, the receipt will be on the UCC, correct? Yes, the UCC. Okay, whenever yeah. whenever you send them anything, you always attach it to a UCC three. Okay. The UCC three is a claim. Okay. See. We're dealing with, when you talk about commerce, there are holders in due course and there are holders. All right. And let me show you what I mean. And I'm going to fall back. All right. Right here. This is why you always use a three. You always use a three because a three is registering it. It's registering your instrument in the commercial chamber into your account and is giving notice to the world that there is a claim against it. Because if you don't give them a notice that you have a claim against that instrument, they can take it free from all claims. And it says it right here, subject to subsection C. And subsection 3106D, holder in due course, means the holder of an instrument if, number one, so you're a holder in due course if these two, these things apply. Number one, the instrument when issued or negotiated to the holder, holder means to the subsequent person to come in possession of the instrument, does not bear such apparent evidence or forgery or alteration or is not otherwise so irregular or incomplete as to call into question its authenticity. Now, what does this mean? This means if I write you a check, you become the holder of the check. And if there's no forgery, the evidence has been forged or somebody looked like they erased, try to erase some ink off of it or something like that, then you can become and you don't have any notice that anybody else has a claim to it. Then that particular person can become a holder in due course of that instrument. Look at number two. The holder took the instrument, okay, the holder is the person. If I write you a check, you become the holder. But if I don't put a notice of a claim on it, that holder can become a holder in due course, okay? Holder in due course up here. If the if any one of these things right here apply, okay? The holder took the instrument, well, all these things have to apply. The holder took the instrument for value in good faith without notice that the instrument is overdue or has been dishonored, or that there is an uncured default with respect to the payment of another instrument issue as a part of the same series. Even if the check is no good, even if it's no good, it still can be negotiated. And they do do this, okay? Because they say it's a negotiable instrument. Number four, notice that the instrument contains an unauthorized signature or has been altered. So if you get this check and you and you still, nobody told you, that there's an unauthorized signature on it, you still can become the holder in due course of it. Number five, here's the one we're looking at. Without notice of any claim to the instrument described in UCC 3-306, number six, without notice that any party has a defense or claim in recoupment described in 3305A. So we know 3306 is claims to an instrument. How do you make a claim to an instrument? A person taking an instrument other than the person having rights of a holder due course is subject to a claim of a property or possessory right in the instrument or its proceeds, including a claim to rescind a negotiation and to recover the instrument, recover the instrument or its proceeds. If you got a claim to the instrument, okay, a person taking an instrument, other than person, you're subject. So that holder, if he gets that instrument, he is subject to a claim of a property or possessory right. How are you going to let this person know you have a property or possessory right in the instrument? Okay, that's what we're talking about. And then, of course, UCC 3-305A is talking about defenses to it, defenses and claims and recoupment. All right, but I'm not going to get deep into that right now, but I wanted you to understand what a holder in due course is, why you always put a notice, you register anything that you send these people on a three, and then you also um, put on, with, on the instrument your UCC filing information, because that is what gives them notice that you have a claim to the instrument. So anybody who, who subsequent holder of that instrument, they can never be the holder in due course of the instrument. They can only be the holder of the instrument. 
And since they are the holder of the instrument, you got to claim a recoupment to that instrument. The means means they got to give it back. It has to be returned back to you. And this will give you some insight on this 1099 OID stuff that we're talking about. Now, does anybody not understand what I just said? Let me pause right here because this is important. We're we following you, brother. We're following you. Keep going. All right. Well, good. All right. Well, let's go. Let's go to the. Um, let's go to the next one. The next paragraph in our letter to the clerk, because this is going to be the cover letter that's going to go on any instruments that we send in to the court to discharge the case. So our next paragraph says, please credit the above referenced account dollar for dollar for the full value of the note or instrument, full value of the instrument. You can put instrument here. You can put put your case number and present it to Mr. Lou no, no later than three days from the date you receive it from the date of receipt. All right, so right here, we're directing them. They're going to have to go to the Treasury Department, okay, because that is all these bonds go to the Treasury Department anyway. So you're telling them what to do. Do they need to present this to the Treasury Department? Anybody not understand that? Now, right here is where we talk about what he was just talking about. If you do the overage, all right, you see this right here. So right here, the court is hereby authorized to utilize the revenue windfall to its benefit until maturity. So if there's a revenue windfall or any instrument that you send them, you're, you're authorizing them to use it for whatever they want to use it for. So, so do you see that? The gentleman who just asked me the question. Yes, sir. I see it. All right. You're expected to issue a settlement statement, warrant, or other confirmation of closure of case number one two three four five six seven eight whatever reflecting the posted credit you may also debit any customary fees, and mailing costs. Please allow 60. Now, you always, whenever you give them a number, you always write the number and then put the number in parentheses. All right? 60 days for final reconciliation. Okay? However, customary banking practices via your treasury account and shorten the duration. So right here, we're giving the judge or uh, uh, giving the uh, clerk, because that's who it goes to the clerk, some final instructions on what to do with the instrument that you're going to be submitting to them. All right, the court is hereby authorized. Let's read the whole thing. The accompanying GSA form, standard form 24, 25, 8, 90, 91, and 28, as well as bonded bill of exchange number 567. I always put a bill of exchange with my GSA forms too. It's hereby presented under notary seal by prearrangement with the Department of Treasury. Treasury Secretary Jacob Lewis, co-payee on the instrument and a holder of the securitization bond reference thereon. 
Please credit the above reference account dollar for dollar for the full value of the instrument, which will be the case number, and present it to Mr. Liu no later than three days after the date you receive it from the date of receipt. The court is hereby authorized to utilize the revenue windfall to its benefit until maturity. In consideration, you're expecting, why are we saying in consideration? In consideration, because we're doing a contract. Contracts have to offer acceptance and consideration. A contract, because this is a contract. So in consideration, you're expected to issue a settlement statement, warrant, or other confirmation of closure of this case number, reflecting the posted credit. You may also debit any customary fees and mailing costs. Please allow 60 days for final reconciliation. However, customary banking practices via your treasury account can shorten the duration. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Now, this is where we get into the tax discussion. But does anybody have any, uh, any uh, questions about what I just read? I got, I got a question. And when you keep saying the clerk, you're not talking about the deputy clerk, or you're talking about the main clerk. The I'm talking clerk. about the main clerk, the one who has a face on the damn website. Okay. I just wanted to put that out there. That's, that's who it is. Everybody else is just deputies. When you talk to the sheriff, you don't talk to the sheriff deputies. There's only one sheriff. There's one clerk. There's one attorney general. Everybody else, there are assistant attorney generals. They deputize them. Agents. You see what so I'm saying? Sure, yeah, just make sure it doesn't go to them, go to the main clerk. Yeah, you know, you don't want to deal with no PIs. You want to deal with, you know, you a master. You deal with another master, you know. You deal with a PIs. You talk directly to them. So please submit your copy of IRS form 1040V, because that's what they're supposed to put, to ensure Treasury can track the transaction. The payment instrument. Oops, let me go up here. <coughs> Has been marked. All right, and this right here is where you're going to put your what number? The payment instrument has been marked. There's your registered mail number that you're sending to them. All right. So you're gonna. Well, how are we sending this? How are we sending this to the clerk? What type of way are we mailing it? Say that again, bro. Okay. Please. Okay. This is the letter. All right. We're, well, I'll just go ahead and say it. I'll wait till I get through. Registered mail. We're sending it registered mail. Okay. This registered mail number should go on your instruments too. Like if you submit them a, a register, a, a international bill of exchange, you want to put the registered mail number that you mail it with on the instrument as well. So the payment instrument has been marked with this registered mail number, okay, and UCC filing number. Okay, right there, filing number, blah, 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 and will be monitored in real time to protect Mr. Lou's interest. It is essential that you post the credit and make presentment to the Secretary of the Treasury or return I'll return the instrument 
for cause with evidence of a substantial legal defect from a qualified third party within three days of receipt. Okay, internal regulations and business as usual do not qualify as substantive legal defects. All right, does anybody want to take a shot and and uh, cipher what this is? Because this is a very very um, uh very 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 powerful paragraph right here anybody want to try to take a shot at this come on I mean, they, they, do that mean they're gonna be in trouble with the irs if they, i mean you basically let them know they're gonna be in trouble with the irs if they don't follow the instructions oh well, yeah it, it does allude to that um <laughs> It does allude to that, uh, and you're absolutely correct. So let's let's look at it. The one let's start with this last uh, sentence. This last sentence right here is a good sentence because what this is talking about: internal regulations and business as usual do not qualify substantive legal defects. What that means is, like, say you try to discharge your car, and somebody tells you, "Well, we don't take promissory notes." Well, I'm not really interested in what you take. Somebody called me today and said, well, uh, you know, do they have to take your instrument? And I said, yeah, they have to take it because the law says they have to take it. And, you know, their internal regulations do not apply. If they say, well, you know, um, like it's just like when I, I had a problem with um, I had some furniture delivered to my house and um, they messed up the order and it ended up being an extra two weeks before I got my furniture. And the lady the customer service lady was apologizing and she was just telling me, well, you know, we've had problems in here, uh, blah, blah, blah. And I told her, I said, ma'am, that is not my concern. You don't have to tell me what's going on inside your company because you said it's going to be here two weeks. That's what I paid for. Now, your excuses that you're giving me of, of no concern of mine. I want to be made whole, so y'all need to give me something, some money off, damn, uh, you know, a lottery ticket or something, you know, uh, some popsicles, something. Give me something make me feel better because you said you were going to do this at this time and you didn't do it. Now you're telling me what's going on inside your company, and that's your internal regulations. So the same thing applies with the court. The court is no different. They are a corporation just like anybody else so when they say well you know we don't want to take you know and i had this happen to me one time i had a uh i had a judge you know i i, I came into the court i said you know i want to i want to pay uh you know i want to pay this with a uh promissory note and he said uh uh he said he said well we only take cash check and credit cards and I said, I said, I'm sorry, is the Honorable Judge willfully violating public policy? And he got scared. He said, no, I'm not. You can't tell me how to pay something because there is no money. Why? They are hiding the true nature of the criminal justice system because it's debt collections and anybody can pay for their case with their signature. It's that simple. Now, I can't make it more simpler than that. All I can do is show you different type of ways that you can go about giving them your signature, but all they need is your signature. They got a thing called a signature bond. They'll let you out of jail with your signature. That's called a, and that's called a, um, it's called a signature bond, but what it is, it's, a, it's an appearance bond with no cost. Cognizance bond is what they uh, is what they officially call it. But a recognizance bond 
and uh, an appearance bond at no cost of the legal terms for. It. That is what they have to submit to you to let you out of jail on your signature. You can get out of jail on your signature, on your promise that you're going to come back and appear. You can sign a bond, but nothing more than your signature. Do you have any questions on that? I got a question. Go ahead. Um, even if you, it, it don't matter if you're incarcerated or not, like as far as uh, state or uh, federal prison, like any prison, right? It's all the same. It don't matter if it's federal or state. They are doing the exact same thing on both levels. Matter of fact, everything that I did was, well, you know, was federal. Most of my work was federal, but I had some state issues too. But federal and state are exactly the same. Have you ever read 27 CFR 7211? Uh, no, I'm out right now. You've never read it. Okay, well, let's read it real quick. All crimes are commercial. Somebody want to read that for me real quick? Yeah, I'll read it. Uh, any of the any? following types of crimes, federal and state, stop. Uh, offenses stop. against stop. The law. Stop. stop. Following types of crimes, what? Federal and state. I don't say federal and state, it's a federal or state. Oh, okay. federal or state. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Federal okay. or state. So, uh, so the question, does it matter if it's federal or state? No. Okay, let's keep going. Offenses, what's the first thing they got, right? Offenses against the what? Revenue law. Everybody know what that means. Any tax laws? All of them are tax laws. They're all revenue laws. What do they have after that? They have a semicolon, which is going to explain everything that comes after that. Okay? All of that, or all that is, burglary is a revenue law. Counterfeiting, forgery, kidnapping, larceny, robbery, illegal dealer possession of deadly weapons, prostitution, all those are offenses against the revenue laws. Okay. Is what what is. the hell is that? What the hell is that? White slave slaving. You know what? I don't. I. You know. I. I <laughs> somebody say what? What is white? You know. I have never. Let me, let's look it up real quick. That's uh, Yusuf. I think that's prostitution. Yeah, I know it's a form of uh, a prostitution, but I don't know what what kind though. Let me see what what is white slaving. Let's see what it what white slaving is. Oh, that's white slavery. <laughs> they joking, right? White slaving. Let's see. <laughs> I don't think it means what we think it means, though. Uh, white slaving, trafficking white slaves. Yep, that's what it means. Trafficking white slaves. White slaving of one, the action of one who procures or holds a woman or women for unwilling prostitution. That's what it is. Okay. I knew it wasn't just dealing with white people. You know, you know, it's when they trafficking them uh, women, trafficking women for sex, white slaving. But I noticed in there it didn't have anything about drugs. Well, yes, it does. It got uh, addiction to narcotic drugs and use of marijuana will be treated as if such were commercial crimes. Uh, you know, I'm not going to go off topic real quick, just for like 30 seconds. How is that possible if they're sitting up here legalizing marijuana now? They're going to have well, to be do this. They legalized it on the state level, not on the federal level. Now, the feds and the, and the states are having are knocking heads about it. I don't know if you've been paying attention to that. If you are uh, right here.
Well, okay, they quietly ended it. Obama administration will not block state marijuana laws. No federal challenge to pot legalization. If enough states legalize, see what I'm saying? Here's Obama right here. Here's all the new stuff that's coming out. If enough states legalize marijuana, federal law may follow suit. See, this is federal law, so this is Obama's talking about it. All right, because when it first jumped off, I think it was, was it California or was, what was the first state that legalized it? Colorado. 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 They were still, you know, they were still arresting people. And so they were, the state law legalized it. So, you know, so the feds ain't legalized it yet. So you have federal law, you have state law. Federal law, they interstate commerce. The, uh, the states deal with intrastate commerce. Everybody in federal prison has an interstate commerce charge. You do know that, right? I don't care. Anything, anything between state lines, right? And, and Traveling lines. State lines. State. I don't care. Whatever it is, if the feds come involved in it, it had something to do with interstate commerce. Okay. All right. I don't want to digress, brother. I, 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 I'm not digressing. This is all related. We're here talking about criminal cases. You're not digressing. This is what we're talking about. Y'all here to learn about <laughs> criminal cases and everything. All right, the reason the reason why I ask is if you're talking about, you know, uh, uh, contraband or uh, guns, if you're talking about uh, drug charges with guns across state lines, but if you stayed in the state with it, they, the, the feds ain't going to come in on you, all right? No, I, got, I had a guy, I had a young, young cat, he was about 17 years old. Um, he had a federal case, ain't never left, he's down in Florida, ain't never left the state of Florida in his life, and ain't never been no major drug dealer. He just, you know, he pushed, pushed little, you know, little, little dope, little dope boy, whatever. And um, he was up in a hotel with his girlfriend. And they got him in the hotel, put him in the fed. And uh, so he showed me his paperwork. I said, okay, what, what, what was it? How did the feds get jurisdiction? So you have to really read the, um, either their, their reports or whatever to find out where the jurisdiction is. Sometimes you can read it in the indictment or something like that, because they'll establish jurisdiction. And what it was is he had a gun on him, and the gun was manufactured in Maryland. They just they just see jurisdiction based on where the gun was manufactured that he had in his possession. Okay, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. They do, st and that's they do stuff just like that, G. They're using a gun. Got you. Never, left, never left the state. Never left the state, but you used a gun for the commission of a crime, they're going to check the history of that gun, find out where it was manufactured, and if it was manufactured in another state, that's going to show up in the report. Because if they they got to have a basis for their jurisdiction. It has to be interstate commerce. So, so if they didn't do if they didn't do the guns and the drugs, they would have used the money that he had on them. Money had on something. They'll start talking about some Federal Reserve notes or something like that. It's going to be something. But it's going to be something like that. It's all going to be, and they won't say, sometimes they won't uh, come out and just say it. It'll just be listed. Like, for instance, somebody will say, well, you don't have jurisdiction over me. They'll say, well, the defendant works at the post office. They won't say, this is how we got jurisdiction. They'll say, oh, you work at the post office, don't you? Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, we're going to go ahead. They ain't going to say <laughs> You know, that's how they do. That's how uh, they, I, see, I, see, I see what you say. I see how they, I, I see the track. That's I how they operate, say. okay? That's how, you know, they go, they're like, okay, nigga, what you talking about? You, we don't got jurisdiction over you. You know, they say, well, you know, you bought, they'll say, the prosecutor will say, well, you know, your honor, the defendant had, um, we looked in his car, and um, he had been out of state on vacation with his wife and and, and and FedEx some material somewhere, and you'll be sitting there going, what the hell does that have to do with my case? And what they're doing is they're establishing jurisdiction. It just goes back to people not knowing that each state is considered like its own country and back and forth. It is. And those... it's under its Republican form and its Democratic form, it's nothing but a subcorporation of the United States. Wow. All right, brother. Go ahead. Yes, Yusuf, I got a quick question. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Oh, actually, it's just two quick ones. You mentioned that you said you don't send anything to Puerto Rico. Uh, why don't you send it to Puerto Rico? Why do you prefer D.C. instead of Puerto Rico? I mean, I'm not saying you can't send it to Puerto Rico. I mean, I'm, trust me, I'm very much impressed. Why do you send it to Puerto Rico? Let me ask you a question. Why do you send it well, to Puerto Rico? 
Well, from, from the little bit of studying that I've done, uh, they say that Puerto Rico is the is the private side of the treasury. But then I listened to something that you said, and it sparked me. You said Puerto Rico really is the port of Rico. So it's basically um, it, it would be federal territory because it's a port. It is federal territory, but so is Washington D.C. Right. I mean, you know, but where they're getting that Puerto Rico stuff? If you want, you want to just study it. The Puerto Rico stuff is right here. This Puerto Rico IRS, all right? What they're right. talking about, this came out of this document by Dan Meter and uh, actually William Cooper is the one that did all the research. And he found right. out uh, that, that um, the old the pale horse. Yeah, behold the pale horse. What they're doing is when you go get your individual master file, they are having you labeled um, uh, a, as a as a uh, like a drug dealer or something like that, engage all American citizens. And I'm gonna tell you what, what what I think it is about Puerto Rico. I think that when they legalized alcohol, what they did was they really didn't want to legalize it because all these laws got a basis in the Bible, in the Bible. So when everybody started pushing for the legalization of alcohol and tobacco. I think I think what they did. This is just my, this is my opinion right now. I don't have anything to substantiate that. But I think what they did was they started labeling everybody some kind of center. And this is what you're seeing reflected in the individual master file in Puerto Rico by they labeling everybody as some sort of uh, some sort of criminal. Because you'll see it in this document right here. And you all see it, see it in one man out. They got the 6209 decoding manual. I know, Michelle, you're on online. I do have a copy of the 6209 decoding manual. I do have that if you want to give it a phenomenal fee. I had to pay to get mine, so you got to pay to get yours. It's $25. You know, I had to hunt it down. But you can get a copy of the 6209 decoding manual because they don't let it out anymore. But I got a copy of it. Okay. I have one other question. How does this work with um, prior military convictions? I don't really, I don't really know. Military is a different branch of government, but I will say this: that all of these courts are territorial courts, which means they fall under the military. The territorial in their aspect that they fall under that ten mile square in Washington D.C. and all their insular possessions. So. We are under some sort of military occupation right now, which is why you have all these federal districts. They did the same thing in the United States that they've done in other countries. Like when they went over to Germany, they put a military base there. When they went to Japan, they put a military base there. They went to Iraq, they put a military base there. Well, they did. They started right here with the Civil War. They had the Civil War here. When the United States won the Civil War, they put military bases all over the country, in all these right. states. That's what they call these districts and chopped everything up in the district. So there is right. a form of a military occupation. Now, um, I haven't studied enough about, um, uh, I did have this military book that actually talks about discharging debt. Uh, there was this uh, young lady, her name is, um, I'm going to tell you who I, I got the information from too. Her name is... Uh, Right here, Creole Harmony. She did some real good research on discharge and debt when she had a military manual that was talking about debt, debt, debt discharge and things of that nature. Um, I haven't looked enough in it to really comment, but the reason I'm saying all of this about the military nature of the occupation of the United States is that all this stuff is military anyway. So I don't right. see why it wouldn't apply in uh, with a military conviction. Because I, I know uh, the military conviction is an automatic felony, and it, it's federal. Of course. Okay. So, but I don't see why it would not apply in that situation, because the military uses admiralty. Right. Don't they? Okay. okay. What about if you bring them under court-martial, uh, find the, the Title IV USC-1? Now, nah, you know what? I'm, I'm going to say this. I don't, I don't teach to people to get into confrontations with them. 
you know, you want to court mark, you want to court martial them and do all that. They operating. I mean, really, to tell you the truth, the American people are the one that's kind of like the traitors. You know, you can't really say they the traitors because that's why they got this trading with the enemy act. All right. Because the American people went into a democracy. OK, the Constitution don't say nothing about no democracy, nor does the Declaration of Independence, nor the Pledge of Allegiance, none of that stuff. All right. The, the American people in 1933, they basically said to the world that they could not take care of themselves. So the United States gave everybody Social Security. What uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt created what is called a welfare state. A welfare state is for individuals who cannot take care of themselves because a free and independent man is not going to take health care from somebody or Social Security or unemployment or all these other benefits and privileges that the government doles out to individuals who don't realize that they are exchanging free rights under the creator of the boundless universe for these little penance of, you know, whatever from the federal government. So the thing is, is that us, the, all the American people, by thinking that they are U.S. citizens, they the actual traitors. They betrayed their 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 legacy and their heritage of their country. So why you want to why you want to uh, uh, court martial them? Uh, you know what you're what people are being looked at is property. Let me read something to you real quick. And that's what's kind of hard for people to accept. And I understand why you know it's it's hard for people to accept because that was a big thing with me when I first got into this. I I go into court all the time, let them know I'm like, man, I'm not your damn property. Or anything, you know, you make you. I made, I made sure that when they met me, they got a very clear understanding that I'm not your damn slave. Okay, so I don't know what you used to, right here in Behold a Poor, Behold a Pale Horse by William Cooper, which is a very good book. There's something in the uh, back of this book that was very, very. Uh, I couldn't believe. Uh, that it was in here, to tell you the truth, but it was a testament to me of William Cooper. He did some, he was excellent, they had to kill him. So he was doing some good research, all right? So right here, Oh, man, what happened? Man, come on, man. Golly, I was just right there, too. I was just right there. What happened? You know, wow. All right, here it is. All right, right here, you're going to see. All right. Right here, let's start right here. He says, I maintain that the world government set up in, in secret during January of 1989 is ultra virus. Ultra virus means outside of any rightful power. That it is outside the law and without legal standing. Therefore, I'm cla I'm, I claim my common law rights as a citizen and not a subject who must submit to search of my home, person, papers, and effects without a properly drawn Fourth Amendment warrant signed by a judge in my county, setting forth under oath the probable cause for believing there is a uh, criminal activity on my part. Here is the point. Now he's going to explain it. He said, read it carefully. Under American constitutional law and the laws of every one of the states, there is no such thing as a civil crime. All crimes, even a humble traffic ticket, are legally criminal in nature and jurisdiction. The only jurisdiction wherein they can be a civil crime or where any court can impose such a penalty is under admiralty slash maritime international law. But what authority does an American walking around with an ounce of marijuana come under the international law of the sea? Isn't he supposed to be under the law of the land? What, okay, now it goes and it says, what is the only way that a citizen of the United States of America can be reduced to a person subject to admiralty maritime law without constitutional rights? Only by contract. Now tell people this only way you can do this is contract. The only way they can give you to give up your rights is through a contract. 
By what contract has an American been forced into such jurisdiction? There may be a number of them which he is absolutely unaware of until it is too late to unravel his personal affairs and then timely claim his lawful rights. With all due respect to my friend Larry Patterson, no federal law can be passed that will do away with the Fourth Amendment. For an American to be subject to search and seizure without a 14th Amendment, uh, Fourth Amendment warrant, he must have already waived those rights by contract or he must have failed to object timely prior to the search. I'm not going to take time and space to list the typical contracts wherein, uh, wherein many have waived, albeit inadvertently, and perhaps through fraud, their common law rights. That has been publicly uh, published previously. However, with all due respect to Attorney General Thornburg, I am not a person subject to such searches without a warrant. I am not under the, the jurisdiction of any court who can impose such prosecution for civil violations. He said, uh, he goes on, are you beginning to see why I must write on so many different subjects? And then it goes on right here. He said, here's another thought that will be a shock to you, but do not under, un, misunderstand me or draw conclusions beyond what I'm teaching. It is not a violation of American common law or any of the common laws of any state to possess marijuana or cocaine for your own personal use. Now, if you're selling it, okay, that is a commercial crime. They, that, they say possession with the intent to distribute. Okay? You are operating a business without a license, utilizing federal re, uh, reserve notes for a, a purpose that has not been authorized for. Oh, hold up, hold up, hold up, brother, hold up. I'm about, to buy ounce, I'm about to buy an ounce of coal from you, and I'm going to give you this car for it. So that, that keeps him out of it completely. Is that what you're telling uh, me? Well, it would probably keep him out of if you gave me some gold for it. But what I would do is just grow it myself. See, when they give you the charge, they're going to give you a charge called possession with intent to distribute. Now, the whole thing about a crime is that it has to be an intent. Intent is the key. What does it say? What do you say? A law and order criminal intent. They got a show on TV called Law and Order Criminal Intent. There has to be some intent. Okay, what they call mens rea, which is intent. So when you listen to them, they are what they are doing is they're construing. They raid your house. You may have just been growing some weed in the backyard for your own personal use. And then they raid your house and then lay you down, lay everybody down and charge you with possession with the intent to distribute. And they go by the quantity of the drugs. Oh, there's too many drugs here. You were intending to distribute that. So I have to I have to dispute that. Yeah, it's like, man, I wasn't distributing anything. I'm smoking that, man. <laughs> I got I got you, brother. I'm just I'm just I'm just tripping. That's all. Yeah, you know, there, there has to be some sort of commerce going on. Now, I like what he's saying right here, though. He says, it's not a violation of American common law or any of the common laws of any state to possess marijuana or cocaine for your own personal use. Until there is a victim, there is no crime. Until they have deprived some other person of life, liberty, or property, no crime has been committed. All the statutes and regulations to the contrary notwithstanding. Most Americans these days, because of the social security contract and other contracts that confer upon their maritime jurisdiction, are legally wards of the state. If you are a ward of the state instead of a free man at law, then the state has jurisdiction to compel you to perform according to contract and take good care of yourself and not smoke pot. The state has a duty to take care of the property and shadow that it owns. And that is what is going on. Because, you, you, you know, the average person should take time to really ask themselves this question. Uh, now, this is going to fly over the head of some people I know, because these are the type, the people head that's gonna fly over are people that think that they got some right to tell somebody else what to do, these self-righteous individuals, all right? Don't nobody have no right to tell me what I can put in my body, it's my damn body. If I wanna do heroin, cocaine, and marijuana every day from now to eternity, that's my business. It ain't none of your damn business. Now, if I'm engaged in some sort of activity that is harming someone else, now it becomes public business. But you don't, that, see, the problem in America is you got self-righteous individuals 
thinking that they can tell other individuals what to do with themselves. Now, here's the problem, though. Because of this health care thing, they got a right to tell you. Because as soon as you get sick, the first thing people do is they run for some sort of aid from some sort of governmental entity. And as such, they got a right to tell people what to do with their body. Because it's costing them money. But on a fundamental level, you need to be asking yourself the question, how can anybody tell me what to put in my body? God gave me my body. They didn't give you your body. So my only duty is to God, if, I, if, you know, if, if I'm any type of moral upstanding person, to take care of the temple that he has provided me with, that's my business. If, you wanna, if I want to destroy that temple, that's my business too. That's nobody else's business. That's for me and for God to take that up with me personally, not for some so-called self-righteous individual here on planet Earth to think they got some right to come and tell somebody what they can do with their body. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? This is the like the first step in really freeing yourself mentally and everything, because you got to understand is how do other individuals have a right to tell you what to do if it is not affecting another individual or their property? I understand you completely, man. Exactly. You got to put that shit to rest. It's like people, people who do that, they need to be decapitated. See, back in the day, they would take people like that and put them on the guillotine. You got the same type of mentality today that is pervasive in the public, and that needs to be uprooted. You got to get rid of those people, man, to be thinking like that, getting them laws, getting all them laws passed and everything. But they, they, they scared, brother. They scared. People scared to die from what they believe in. I agree with you 100%. I agree. I agree. But let let's, let me not digress too much. Uh, let, let's let's go back. Let's get back to the letter. But I wanted to show you all of that. And let's get back to the letter. So right now, this is a cover letter. Y'all saw I put it together. All right. This is a cover letter. It's going to go to our forms that we're going to turn in. I need to get through this letter. This letter has all the information in it. That's why I'm going through this letter. Okay. Anybody can put together a GSA form. All right. Ain't hard to do. You can do GSA's forms in 15 minutes and have them ready to go. Put a thumbprint on them and it's out of there. All right. But you got to give them some instructions that demonstrate that you know what you are doing because they're always going to challenge you or test you on what you are, what you know. So right here, let's go to the next paragraph. We got, we already we telling them to put a 1040V in it. That's a payment voucher. Okay, you put a 1040V in there with it. And I'm going to show you how we put this up. We're going to do a notice of filing. It's a notice of filing, okay? So right now, they to post the credit or identify a defect within 10. Always write the word, the number out, and then put it in parentheses. 10 days will be certified in a All right, so this is tell you what you don't do. You're going to do an administrative process with them. Give them 10 days. If they don't identify any type of defect in anything that you've done, you're going to default them out. And what you're going to do with it after you default them out, you're going to do what? File with the clerk. File the default with the clerk. And I'm going to show you in Georgia, we got the law that, that says that. That's what you're supposed to do. Now, that judgment will comprise your stipulation. Anybody want to tell me what a stipulation is? Somebody tell me what it is. Because that's all they talk about in clerk's practice. That word stipulation is used like five million times in clerk's practice. So anybody want to tell me what a stipulation is? What Explain stipulation to me. Agreement. 
It means agreement. It does. In court. Now, here's the thing. When you are in a criminal case, there are no such thing as facts. Okay? What do I mean when I say there isn't such thing as facts? Anybody can say anything about you. You either going to agree what they say about you or disagree. If you agree, that's a stipulation. If you disagree, that means there's a material issue in fact, which means we need to go to a jury trial or a bench trial. Everybody does know what a bench trial is. Anybody not know what a bench trial is? It's a bench trial, bro. Is you going before the judge? The judge is the jury. Any questions before I finish this next paragraph? And I'm not providing anybody a copy of this letter. Why am I not providing anybody a copy of this letter? Anybody want to take a... Because you want, you want people to do it for themselves to, uh, to want, put it in their own words. I want them to write it out themselves. You know, they're going to, y'all going to have a copy of this video, so you'll have the letter. But I mean, I'm not, I'm not putting anything in the drop box like where you just go and fill in the blank or anything like that. That's not happening. Why do I do that? I do that because how I teach a lot of people out there want people to give them something. Y'all, a lot, lot of y'all just want y'all run over here to this guru and that guru looking for somebody to give you instant remedy. There's like y'all instant remedy junkies and everything. And I love instant remedy junkies. I don't have a problem with them because that's that's like the instant remedy junkies is like where we make our money, really our, our big money from from instant remedy junk. Because you just say I got the remedy and they buy. You know what the thing is is that. Concerned with people, use of there are no instant remedies, is it? I mean, really, it's not not the it way that really you go. but you know, you got people who looking for it, you know what I'm saying? They look, you know, just give me a piece of paper to file, and uh, you know, so I can make this go away, you know what I'm saying? They got, you know, it's just that nobody wants to learn anything. Y'all remember my I had a mentor, he was uh. He, he, he played with the Washington Redskins. He was very wealthy. He's what, worth about $30 million. And uh, he went, he's in Dallas, Texas. And uh, he used to go to the Dallas Cowboys, um, you know, a uh, lot of, uh, you know, uh, Michael Irvin, all them boys and everything. And, uh, you know, just go to him and like, you know, this is what he told me at least. Uh, I don't know if it was Michael Irvin in particular, but it was a lot of the, um, um, uh, uh, some of the Dallas Cowboys and things like that. And uh, he, he wanted investment opportunities for him. He said, look, you know, I want you to bring you in because he was a real estate developer. So he's trying to help. You know, a lot of athletes, they get their money and they lose it. So, you know, let me show you how to invest in real estate. And he would take five young boys every year and make them millionaires. You take five young men under his wing every year and teach them how, uh, teach them how to develop real estate. Brothers, this was a brother, too. And and the five young men he'd take would be they be young black men, and um, he used to tell me he said you can't get them to listen to nothing, they ain't interested in it. See, people aren't really interested in something when they have a problem. They but they they say here just give me here I just give you the money you just go do it. That is you know that was the attitude that they have. But none of them really interested in learning how to develop real estate. They just wanted to just give somebody some money and have them do it. And he was talking about how bad that was. And that's the same thing with trust law. A lot of people, they want you to put together a trust for them. But I know for a fact that on the higher levels, the family, everybody in the family got to know how to operate a trust. It ain't just somebody put it together for you. So the same situation applies right here. You know, you're trying to get somebody out of jail. If you're just looking for somebody just to give you some paperwork and make it happen and everything, and you not understand what's going on, you're not going to get very far. You're going to be keep coming, going back, paying somebody or something like that. This is a study. And the thing is that you, I know time is of the essence and people have, you know, they're pressed for time on a lot of issues. But once you have um, caught a case, you really, 
you really you're being reactionary now. So you're working uphill. Uh, all, all this stuff we teach you is proactive information. You should have already had all your UCC filings and done before a problem ever hit your doorstep. And everybody had been given proper notice because commerce works with proper notice, as you can just see with that holder in due course. So once they put a charge on you, a charge is a lien. Let me let me show you this real quick. It always helps for you to look up simple words. Like how many people have ever looked up the word charge in a Black's Law Dictionary? Anybody look that up? No. Well, this is what I'm talking about. All right. Let's look up the word charge. What is a charge? Let's look it up. Let's see what it says. Now, I'm going to teach you about senses of words, and I, and I got a very good doc, uh, justice story. I put a book on, my, on, the, on the web, the Interpretation of the Constitution, and he talks about that in that particular book. I was reading that book, and it was real interesting to see him talk about senses of words, definition of words in their different senses. All right, so here we got charge, okay? Let's look at it. Now, you're going to notice that you got a first definition. Second definition, you got the third definition, fourth definition, fifth definition, six and seven. So we got, these are called senses. All right, so we have seven different senses of the word charge. Now I'm going to ask a question. How do we know which one of these senses to use as it applies to when they say, I'm going to give you a charge? When a police officer stops on the street, I'm going to give you a charge. How we know which one he's talking about right here, these seven different senses of the word charge? And what sense of the word is he talking about? I guess I ask him. Where you get his definition? You can get you can ask him. What do you mean by charge and from where do you derive your definition? All right, that is that 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 has happened. But how you do it is you have to understand the nature of whatever you're in. If you are in a common law court, it'll take on one meaning. But what kind of court are we in? We're in a commercial court, right? Yes. So if we're in a commercial court, then we should be looking for a commercial sense of the word. So what do we have right here? An encumbered lien or claim. So when they say, I'm gonna, so they say I'm going to give you a charge. I'm, I'm, it's a claim. Now, let's look in Georgia. Let's see. Well, Yusuf, how, how do we know that is what that's talking about? Okay. Well, let's go to, because they, they start talking about, hopefully we got some attorneys on here, because I'll be busting attorneys out with this shit. They like to sit up and act like they're smarter than everybody. But let's look at this. I'm going to go to Georgia real quick. Oh, uh. Actually, uh, yeah, let me, I forgot, I got this on my website. Right here, if we go to, uh, Where is that? Georgia. Right here. Right here, Georgia Criminal Code. All right. This book, and I, I know some other people have been on some other webinars. I mean, they always see me talk about this, but I just want you to connect this up. I'm going to keep on pounding it on y'all till y'all see it. You see right here, this is OCGA 1711-1, which is criminal proceeding. They got this in every, they got this in every state. It's just they got it written a different way. This is criminal procedure. I got it out the law library. All right. You see right here, imposition of costs and prosecution of the defendant generally. 
All right, and it says the cost of prosecution, except the fees of his own witness, should not be demanded of a defendant until after trial or conviction. If convicted, the judgment may be entered against the defendant for all cost. And this word cost is the key word, C-O-S-T-S. -S. This is what they are putting you in prison for. You have to pay the cost to be the boss. You're paying the cost of your incarceration. Does everybody understand that? All right. Yes. All costs accruing in the committing trial courts and any officer pending the prosecution. The judgment shall be a what? Lean. Okay. So they're charging you, and it tells you right there. They're letting, they're letting you know it's a lien from the date of his arrest on all the property of the defendant. Now, let's go back to clerk. This right here. It's a charge on what? On the property in the lien. Okay, they're telling you they're putting a lien. So that's how I know that they're talking about that sense of the word. So don't be telling me I don't know what I'm talking about. This is commercial. They put in liens on you. That's why you do a secure party process because you have to have a priority interest in your property or else they're going to lean it up. And you need to know what property means. Because property ain't talking about real estate. Your freedom is your property. Your name is your property. Your children are your property. Your wife is your property. I know you women don't want to hear that, but y'all are property. <laughs> I got our property for real. But anyway, <laughs> but no. <laughs> uh, excuse me, I have a question. All right, go ahead. Uh, can your parents be your property at all? Because I know a lot of state people say children are grandchildren, but they never go up. Well, you know, once your parents become, you know, what, like once your parents become elderly and they're not, and they can't take care of themselves anymore, I don't see why not. They can't be considered okay. under your, under your, under your care. They become your property, you know. Property doesn't mean it doesn't have the, you know, we kind of attach kind of like an evil connotation attached to this word property, but, you know, it's not really evil in that sense. You know what I'm saying? It's just something, it's an interest in something. We talk about property. You see what I'm saying? Okay. All right. Thank you. Are you you're welcome. But y'all see what I'm talking about, these, sense, these different senses of the word. You got to understand, well, what sense are they talking about? It's putting an encumbrance, a lien, a claim. They're claiming something. That's one of the definitions of charge. Okay? So that, you need to know that. What is a charge? He got, so I got charges. My son has five charges. They put an encumbrance and a lien against him. This is why we're talking about doing the secure party process. You have to put a you have to put a priority lien against you have to you have to protect your assets, okay? By leaning stuff up. And I'll give you a very easy analogy. Then we're gonna take a quick break. Let's say you have a house that is free and clear. I right? if somebody finds out that you have that house free and clear, and let's say it's worth a million dollars. If that house is free and clear, that is equity, and equity, that, that somebody can come and get that. All they need to do is lean it up. So if I come over to your house, I find out, let's say I'm an evil person, and I find out that your house is free and clear, and I come over to your house, and then all of a sudden I pretend to slip down and fall, and then take you to court, win a judgment, and then come put a lien against your property. All right? Well, to prevent that, what you could do is once you have your house free and clear, you could form a trust or a corporate. I would do it a trust. And then you can have your trust come in and put a lien against your property. That way, if I was to come over and then slip and fall and say, OK, you owe me this house and I put a lien against it. Yeah, I can put a lien against your property, but that property is a second. It is called it is inferior to that lien I placed. So before you ever see a dime, I got to get paid first, depending on the amount of money. This is why people have uh, liens against a straw man for $100 billion and $200 billion. The numbers have to be big enough where they couldn't possibly come up with a charge that would supersede that. This is the whole purpose of doing a UCC-1 filing. 
is to have a priority interest in your property because there isn't any money. So how money is being made now is by people putting liens against other people's property and then monetizing those instruments. Y'all understand? They securitize everything. Are there any questions, real quick? And all that's in your secure party webinars, right? Yes, it is. But I want y'all to see this, okay? This word charge, you need to understand that. Also, the word tax. What is a tax? I'm going to read this to you, then we're going to go to break. What is a tax? Because right here, it tells you also the judge has no discretion in taxing cost against the defendant convicted defendant they talk about tax they this is why i go to the law library because you'll find out a lot more stuff when you open up the books that it's all a tax so right here what is the word tax mean so we look at tax Boy, that's a lot of ends, boy. All right. All right, right here. Tax. A monetary what? Charge, a monetary charge. Let's read what the experts say about tax. Taxes are the enforced proportional contributions. All right, this word right here, you need to look up the word war contribution. From persons and property levied by the state by virtue of its sovereignty for the support of government and for all public needs. This definition of tax is often referred to as Cooley's definition, has been quoted and endorsed or approved expressly or otherwise by many different courts. Now, let's look at this right here. Um, that's not what I wanted. Where is it at? Where is that? I want I wanted to I want to show y'all. Taxes, taxes, withholding tax. That wasn't it. That must have been another dictionary. I wanted to show you what why they tell you a tax can be paid um, in ways other than with money. I a lot of people think taxes only pay. Oh, here it is, right here. Although uh, although a tax is often thought of as being pecuniary in nature, pecuniary means money. This is what this word means. In nature, it is not necessarily payable in money. So my question to you, if a tax can't be paid in money, then how can it be paid? With the instrument? An instrument is right here. They they, they talk about instruments because I also, if, if it can be paid some other way, this is why they said pecuniary. All right, you need to look this word up, pecuniary. It's not, we're not talking about utilizing any type of negotiable instrument whatsoever. You're not using negotiable instruments. You're not using Federal Reserve notes. If you're not using any of those things, what other kind of way can you pay a tax? A person, you're you you your body. Yeah. Labor. Labor. Put you in jail. And where do I get that from? Let's look and see where did that come from in law. Right here. 
was the statute right here this right here statute merchant all right one of two 13th century statutes enabling procedures to better secure recovered debts by among other things providing for a commercial bond that if not timely paid resulted in swift execution of the lands goods and bodies of the debtor all right also okay now here's the second sense of the word the commercial bond so established when they put a lien on you a lien is evidence of a debt they can write a bond on it I, it is it is not a little remarkable that our common law knew no process whereby a man could pledge his body or liberty for payment of a debt under Edward the first uh, Edward the first the tide turned in the interest of commerce a new form of security the so-called statute merchant was invented which gave the creditor power to demand the seizure and imprisonment of the debtor's body. This is what they're doing today. All right. They are seizing you and you read their laws. That's all they're talking about. You know, sequestering property, seizing it, putting attachments, five phase or whatever against debtors and putting you in jail for payment of a debt. So you can pay with a tax without money. You can pay with a tax with your body. Is anybody is confused on that? What I just said. I'm not confused, but what about when they when they arrest you and then they don't they hold you for like a month and they don't charge you or nothing and just let you go? I mean, in that in that case, they couldn't put no lien on you. They couldn't attach you for some reason. You know, I don't know. I don't know why. I, I couldn't tell you what happened behind the scenes. But, you know, that's why you want to do some sort of process and everything to make yourself unalienable. Unalienable, because they are leaning you. A lien is the evidence of, let's look up the word lien. What is a lien? Because they, because they try to tell you in court, well, this ain't no creditor and debtor issue. Okay, I just read in your law, it says you put a lien on me when you find me guilty. You put a lien on me. So what is a lien? Lien, a legal right or interest that a creditor has in another's property, lasting usually until the debt or duty that it secures it is satisfied. So we're talking about a creditor debtor situation, aren't we? If right here in this book they say that they put a lien, right here in Georgia, they say right here that they find you guilty, the judgment shall be a lien. That creates a creditor and debtor relationship, which is admiralty, by the way. Does anybody not understand what I'm talking about right now? Let me just pause for a second and make sure y'all 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 follow me. I gotta I gotta um, take a quick break. Let's take a quick break. When I come back. We're going back to the letter. We're going to finish the letter, and I'm going to go over uh, uh, this letter, and then we're going to go over into the bonds and so forth. All right, so take a 15-minute break. When I come back, we'll continue. In fact, y'all need to read this stuff in this book right here, right right here, where you talk about executing. Um, you need to download this off my website. It's on my website, and you need to read all this stuff where you talk about imprisonment for failure to pay cost. What does that sound like? Imprisonment for failure to pay costs. Ain't that the statute merchant? Right here. Um, extended priority of lien generally. Uh, let me tell you right here. It says cost of feeding prisoner while prisoner is in prison awaiting trial or part of court costs collectible from the defendant. All right. So all them, all them 30, 60 days, a year that you sit in jail and they feed you hot dogs, you're paying for that. And a real good one is this one right here. Cost or collectible by levy of a 5A. What is that? You need to see this stuff. They're telling you everything right here. I mean, they, they tell it to you. I mean, they do not hide anything. I mean, really, it's incredible to me. But anyway, let's take a five-minute break. When I come back, we're going to continue.
All right, I'm back. Let me ask everybody something real quick. Everybody there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I want y'all to yes, understand. Sir. Okay, I want y'all to understand why I'm taking y'all through this. See, it's very easy to put together paperwork, but when you understand, I have to get the conviction in your mind that what you're doing is right. You got to understand and see that this is commercial, it's dealing with liens and all of this. You got to see this. And then you begin to understand, okay, because somebody asked me, well, do they have to take the GSA bonds? Okay, let's examine the nature of the system. Then you can make that determination for yourself. You know, nobody have to answer that question for you when you begin to see that this is commercial. You, you see what I'm saying? So it's like, that. that's why I'm, I'm taking you through all this because it's very easy. I already did several webinars on GSA bonds. I shouldn't have to keep going through how to do a GSA bond. But this letter is the cover, cover letter GSA bonds, okay? And then the enforcement provisions that are going to be, because this letter contains all the necessary action that you are going to be taking, okay? So let's look at the next paragraph. All right, let's look at the next, the next paragraph. Okay. Failure to post the credit or identify a defect within 10 days will be certified in the default judgment by the notary to be issued and filed with the clerk of court. That judgment will comprise your stipulation to the value validity of the instrument and confession of a theft of public funds when you defaulted on an opportunity to rebut. A return of the instrument without cause will be certified as conversion of liability under public policy in other words, your agreement to accept liability for the missing funds. Any attempt to malign payment without a demonstrative notice of dishonor or certificate of protest will be treated as commercial slander. So here we know that we're dealing with an administrative process. You're going to send them your GSA bonds, bill of exchange, or whatever you decided, birth certificate, whatever you decided to utilize to discharge the debt with. And you are telling them that you're expecting them to do the right thing and accept the instrument. Now, somebody asked me today, and hopefully, if the, per if, if the person today asked me, called me and asked me, do they have to take these bonds, this is what we're dealing with, okay? The thing about it is, they, they, the only way that they don't have to take them is if they can demonstrate that there is something wrong with them. And that would mean that they would have to dishonor them, and that would have to be demonstrated through a certificate of protest or something to that effect. But for just them just to come along and say, we don't take that, they can't do that. They have a duty to follow commercial protocol. And if they don't follow that, then they are liable. They are culpable. And that is what this sentence is saying. All right? okay, it said a return of the instrument without cause will be certified as a conversion of liability under public policy. In other words, your agreement to accept liability for the missing funds. They're going to be liable for that. 
So let's look. It's getting more juice here. Let's look at the next paragraph. What the next paragraph is going to say. All right, it gets juicier. In any event, in any event, legal fiction use of veil is required to report your gain on the form 1099-OID. The creditor intends to report all suspicious activity and honor his misprison of felony obligation. Did anybody know what misprison of felony means? Anybody know what that word means? Misprison of felony. No, brother. Would it be false imprisonment? No. It's an obligation to report a crime in a short sense, but we're going to look it up. I haven't looked it up in a long time. So let's look it up together. Miss Prison. All right. Miss Prison. Concealment or non disclosure of a serious crime by one who did not participate in the crime. So, what are we talking about? Okay. If you see something, you have a duty to report it. Okay. In fact, whatever the law may be, it is not the general custom to prosecute for misprison of felony, even where a person who knows of a felony is questioned by the police and refuses to make a statement. Indeed, Stephen, writing in the 19th century, regarded the offense as practically obsolete, and American courts have refused to rec recognize it as subsisting. But there have been four successful prosecutions in England during the last quarter century. Glanville Williams. So misprison of felony is a duty for you to report a crime. They don't prosecute for that hardly. But, you know, so let's read it again. In any event, legal fiction use of ale is required to report your gain on a 1099 OID. You put out a 1099 OID every time that you... Now, let me tell you all something. I've had this information. This letter right here is 10 years old. This is how long I've been knowing about this. Uh, you got to do a 1099 or ID, all of this stuff. You got to put the tax on these people. In any event, legal fiction use of AL is required to report your gain on a form 1099 or ID. The creditor intends to report all suspicious activity. What do we susp report suspicious activity on? What do we report that on? Anybody want to take a shot at that? Okay. One of the forms, one of the forms that you didn't show us. Okay. And somebody said, well, what if we don't have their tax ID number? Great question. That's the, the very next paragraph was going. Somebody must have been reading my mind. Ask me that. All right, let's, uh, oops.
Let's go to uh, Yusuf. Is it the two eleven? Suspicious. I think it is suspicious activity form IRS. I think it's two eleven. Yeah, the FinCEN. I think this is it right here. Sufficient activity report by money service business. That's one of them. Yeah, here it is right here. This is what you report suspicious activity on. You fill out one of these when they don't do what they're supposed to do. FinCEN says uh, filing and instructions. Here it is right here. FinCEN. All right. This is what that is referencing. Suspicious activity reports. Well, basically what you're saying is the IRS is there to help you. The IRS is there to help you. I'm sure you've heard of this before. If you've been involved, the IRS is your friend. Okay, this is your enforcement. You enforce what they're doing by making them balance the books. This is how you get them to release someone. Because when you give them your bonds and everything and they don't release them, what they're doing is they're leaving the escrow open on the case and they're refusing to balance the books. So you have to bring somebody else in who can force them to balance the books. And you do that by reporting them on the proper tax forms. So somebody just said, well, what if we do not have their tax ID? Well, let's look at what our next paragraph is. Anybody know what a W-9 is? Anybody know what an IRS form W-9 is? No. Isn't that the form that you, from the, this, this, you get their tax number with that form, correct? Yeah. Yep. Somebody look it up and tell me. Well, I mean, y'all got each other in computer. Yo, somebody look it up and tell me what a W-9 is, IRS form W-9. That's a request uh, request for identification number. You send that in to request their EIN number. That's right. So you want their tax tax number so you can report them. I did that on my property tax. Um, I went up to the talk to the tax commissioner and I told him I wanted his um, tax ID number and this nigga never came to talk to me. I mean, I, I stayed up there too. I had to leave. I got to come back. I'm going to hit him with a letter. Because they tell me, well, you know, we, you know, we don't have to give you that. I said, yes, you do. I'm giving y'all money. What you mean? I don't have to, I don't have to give you. I, 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 don't, I have to, You don't have to give me a tax number. That go for probation officers. That go for anybody you give you give some money to. What they what are they trying to say that if I give them some money, that's free money? No, ain't nobody in the public is entitled to receive anything from somebody in the private and not be reported. Not a not a penny. Anybody have any questions on that? All right, well, let's, 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 the next part. Anybody know what a warrant is? A check. That's right. It's a negotiable instrument. It is a check. That's exactly right.
All right, let's look at this next paragraph. Somebody asked me why I don't have the W-9. Okay, let's look at it. Please complete the W-9 form and return to the undersigned no later than 10 days from the postmark to facilitate such reporting. Typically, the IRS Criminal Investigation Division seizes the full amount of funds on behalf of the Treasury and a warrant is issued to the marshal for distress of the respondent's public hazard bond on behalf of the Treasury. The alien property custodian thereby rendering the party uninsurable for public service. Any such commercial process will be audited by the Comptroller General of the President's Corporate Task Force. So let me ask you a couple of questions. What do we mean right here for the stress of the, of the respondent's public hazard bond? What does that mean? Can somebody answer that for me real quick? Isn't that because all public servants are, are bonded? They have to be bonded in order to hold that office? Yes, but what is the distress of the republic's uh, of a respondent's public has a bond? What does that mean? Well, that you basically come against it. Exactly, that you are seizing their bond because it tells you right there, making that party, rendering the party uninsurable for public service. Isn't that what we want to do? Now, we're going to talk about that. you want to make them uninsurable for public service if they don't do the right thing. In other words, they can't work as a judge. They can't work as a sheriff, deputy, or whatever, police officer, or whatever. You do that by making them uninsurable because everybody in the public has to have a bond. So if they don't have a bond, they can't work. So if you attack a bond, they can't work anymore. Does everybody understand that? So is the letter starting to float a little bit now? We see right now, if you're just joining us, we did the caption. This is the caption of the pleading. You're going to make the caption match. It doesn't matter if it's federal or state, whatever it is. You can write letters like this. You can do an injunction if you want on this. This is what you do it on. I, I do this all the time. As a matter of fact, when I have a case and, I'm, and, I, and, I, and I tell my attorney to do something for me, every time I ask my attorney to do something for me, I write a letter and I always write him a letter like this. And I file a copy of the letter with the clerk of court. If I gave him any type of instructions, if I told him, I said, look, I need you to go to my mama house and, you know, pick up my, uh, uh, give us some money for me. I, whatever it is, I write a letter right here. And I put it on this, I put it in this, because what happens is most of the people, um, and we're going to talk about that too, the attorney letter. Most people, uh, in jail, they try to get back in court for ineffective assistance of counsel, but they never documented the ineffective assistance, what type of directions or anything that you have given your attorney. You have to document all of this stuff and make it a part of the record, especially, especially when you're doing these private processes, because your attorney is the one, you got to give him the instructions on what to do. And anytime you give that any, anybody in the public, you're dealing with any instructions, if you're writing the governor, if you're writing a judge, you always put it on this pleading format because later on, that's letting them know that if need be, you will make this a part of a case. Everybody get that? Yes. We need to ask Yusuf on that issue. It sounds like a defensive tactic. What do you mean? Intimidating court officials. It's not intimidating court officials. It's giving them notice that they expect to do. Why are you going to intimidate a court official? I don't have to intimidate you. You need to do your job. First of all, they are administrators. Administrators mean that they have a ministerial duty to perform. And if they don't perform their duty as required by their statutory codes, then they shouldn't have a job. Why do you think they have a bond? The bond, the performance bond, is ensure that you do your job. And if you don't do your job, then you don't need a job. I don't feel bad. That's not intimidating. That's what you do. Anybody work a job on any corporation. You don't do your job, go sit your ass at home. They gave you three counts, so you got charges. So what were your counts? And what did you tell the judge? What did you say to the judge? They gave you three, they gave you three counts of what? One, two, 
Well, unmute yourself. You don't know how to unmute yourself? Kill Bay. I don't know. You have, you probably don't have your phone. You don't have your. Uh, I sent your audio pin. Click on audio and look and enter your pin number. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what happened was, um, I sent some paperwork in with them on a charge that they had arrested me on. So I did the nationality and all of that. And when I sent, I sent a um, 1099C collection cancellation of debt. 1096 and a 1099A. And I sent a letter, but I didn't send it in the form that you're typing it in right now. Right. I just sent a to demand notice to fiduciaries. They sent me a letter back, said that they were not accepting it, and then they came and arrested me for three counts of intimidating court officials. What did your letter say? It says, this is to inform the Fulton County Superior Court of full closure and settlement of the case. Because they arrested me two times. They arrested me one time, then they falsely arrested me again. Okay. So I got all the fiduciaries, which is the judge, the clerk, um, the district attorney, his assistant. And I, I, I attached a W-9 form. I told them to fill it out for their personal tax identification. Right. I requested the 1040 form. Because right. I let them know I had to report it to the IRS. And I told them what violations they were in. They came and arrested me. They gave me three counts of intimidating. What do you mean they came and of intimidating? Okay, and intimidating in what way? What was the intimidation? The paperwork that I sent in. <laughs> I mean, what was intimidating about it? What was. I mean, what, That's what, what I asked them. But they sent like seven people, seven officers to my job and arrested me. And now they're saying they thought I was trying to put a lien on them. And okay, I was like, so, uh, okay, no. so who is the person that sent the seven officers? That's who the judge. Okay, so yeah, you need to get him. You need you do yeah. need to get his bond because that he obviously you scared him, but you need to let him but, know that you ain't scared. You what know, happened like, was him and his whole branch, him is the um the judge, the prosecutor, and his clerk of the court, they excused themselves from the case. And now I got a new judge. Yeah. With three charges. And what I'm going to do on, on next week, because I ain't do no show this week. I took a break. But next week, I'm going into commercial liens. I'm going to go uh, talk about liens and everything. We need to talk about that. Because we need some enforcement to start going against these people because they're not doing what they're supposed to do yeah, the taxes is what you have to address the taxes is what you have to address that's why they send seven officers to come arrest you but when you do this kind of stuff you always do it through a notary did you do it through a notary yeah i had a notary right and i'm gonna show you how to do a notice of filing also did you give them any bonds did you give them any bonds no, no that's what i was saying i i, I think i left that out I didn't do no bonds at all. The thing about it is, is the thing about it is, is you always got to pay for the case. You always got to be in honor. Pay mm -hmm. for the case because you're asking them to take care of something and then you didn't give them anything to take care of it with. Yeah, I kind of figured that out after listening to you tonight. Yeah, you know, it's like, okay, you know, it's like, okay, you want me to take care of this, but what I'm going to take care of it with? You just like, I can't close escrow on this. I need some sort of asset currency to put on these books. So it's, it's all banking. Always remember that this is banking. The national, when you do nationality, all right, let me talk about that for a second. The nationality is they're trying to function in the same way that a lot of people are um, doing by becoming private. You're saying you're outside the jurisdiction of the United States. Everything that is outside the jurisdiction, let me, and how many new people do we have on here tonight? We have any new people on here tonight? Mm -hmm. It's your first time. Yeah. Is y'all first time doing a webinar with me? Yes. Yes, my first. Okay, cool. All right. On my website, you're going to see this document right here. It's the public and private outline. Okay. This is what sep uh, separates the men from the boys. If you will learn this chart, put your head and shoulders above everybody in the game. All right. You got to understand the breakdown of the law. How is the law broken down? All right. All law is subject to natural law. Well, God's law. 
okay, which are immutable, which is what a real law is. And then you have a shadow of that, which is called man, uh, man-made law or what they call in legalese positive law. Now, positive law breaks down into two branches called substantive law and procedural law. And from procedures, you get remedies. And from substantive law, you get the rights of the parties, which breaks down into public and private law. Now, what the more, now see, when you say, what is my nationality? If I ask you a question, where does nationality fit on this chart? Well, we talk about law now. So where does nationality fit on this chart? No way. It does fit on here. It fits on here. But see, if nobody, if, if a person or more can't tell me where it fits, then I have to question his knowledge of law because you claim it because you keep saying, well, you need to claim your nationality. OK, where does where does nationality fit in the sphere of law? When you talk about law, when you go to law school, they have to do this. You have to have substantive law, procedural law, remedial law, public international law, private international law, contract law, tort law, status law, uh, family law. Uh, tax law, criminal law, administrative law, constitutional law. Where does it fit in all of that? Private law. It would be on the private side. It would be on the private side. So when you talk about public and private law, on the public side, you got constitutional law, criminal law, tax law is also public law. You have administrative law, public international law. And on the private side, you got contract law, tort law, status law, property law, family law, private international law. You got to know on what side of the fence you're on. The double minded man can hope to receive nothing from the law. You got to be either all right or you're not right at all. OK, you have to know on which side of the fence you're operating on. The reason that the corporations are operating privately is because they're engaging you in contracts. The United States of America or the United States is a private corporation, private for-profit corporation, which means they're operating on this side of the law, which is why they're always presenting you with a contract. This is why when we used to go into court, we would say, is there a victim or is there a contract? Because to pull me into an Article One legislative tribunal under Article One, Section Eight, Clause Nine, which is given authority from Article One, Section Eight, Clause Seventeen, you have to have a contract. That's what private people engage in. So when they say, "Well, your nationality," you're saying you're say really saying you're going private. You're really saying I'm going back into the republic. I'm going without the United States. I'm, be, I'm tax exempt. I'm unalienable. Okay, that is what you're saying. All that fits on that side of the fence. Brother, help me understand this real quick. If that's the case, then how, how can a corporation uh, uh, contract with a, a real live breathing human being? They don't contract with you per se. They contract with your straw man, and you are the uh, you're looking at an accommodation party for that straw man or a surety. That's what's happening because public and private do not mix. And they're like quasi-public, quasi-private. If you get an American jurisprudence book, you will see them say this in American jurisprudence, that these corporations, these municipalities operate quasi-public, quasi-private. They jumping back and forth on different sides of the fence. And this uh -huh. is why you also have the Clearfield Doctrine. When they start to contract, they descend to what? What does the Clearfield Doctrine say? Oh, they're jumping I haven't read it. Let's pull, let's pull it out. Let's read it real quick. Okay. Whereas defined pursuant to Supreme Court and a statute, blah, blah, blah. Governments descend to the level of a mere what? Private corporation and take on the characteristics of a mere private citizen where private corporate commercial paper and securities is concerned. All right. So when they start dealing with these Federal Reserve notes, which are which is don't have nothing to do with the with the United States government. All right. That's the Federal Reserve is a private bank. So when you start using the private script of somebody else, they lose their governmental character and they descend to the level of a private corporation and the characteristic of a what a mere what? 
private right. citizen. So on what side of the fence are they on? Private. Private side. They operating. So now, what side of the what side is the Constitution? Constitution is what kind of law? Public law. So, Public law. so when they say they're operating outside of the Constitution, they are. And they know they are. And that's why the Constitution don't have nothing to do with you. The Constitution sets up government and it's a limitation on government. If you're ever on the private side, this don't give you no rights. God gives you rights. This is what gives you rights up here. This don't give you rights. This right here protects your rights. It prevents them from encroaching into your private domain. And this is the domain of God, by the way, because the laws, the contract, the first contract you make is with who? Who do you contract with first? What covenant do you make with whom first? Uh, God. And that's your religion. That's why there's a separation of church and state. Your religion governs you. And they will not encroach upon that. But what they have done is they have given all the corp the religions licenses. And they've taken you from over here and now brought you back over here. Wow. That's why they got a book out on my website. If you go to my website, I got a book right here. And that's what, and this Father Moore is the Illinois Religious Corporation Act. Y'all should all read that. Um, this book right here in Caesar's Grip. This is for anybody who's involved in a religion, church, or anything like this. This book right here is it was done to research on the government issuing all of these religions, these damn light, these 5013Cs. And I'm going to show you what this IRS agent had to say. He said, um, having worked for the IRS, look at this IRS agent said right here. He said, having worked for the IRS for some 20 years, I can attest to the validity of everything Mr. Kershaw brings out in this book regarding the applicability or lack thereof of the Internal Revenue Code to churches and ministries. The IRS has never required a church to seek a tax-exempt status. The IRS position has always been that churches are automatically tax-exempt and tax-deductible without ever having to apply for a 501c3 recognition. Nevertheless, many thousands of churches have submitted Form 1023 to the IRS for the privilege of being something that even the IRS acknowledges that they already have. I'm not the only IRS employee who has wondered why churches go to the government and seek permission to be exempted from a tax they didn't owe to begin with and seek a tax deductible status that they always had anyway. Many of us have marveled and our church leaders want to be regulated and controlled by an agency of government that most Americans have prayed would just get out of their lives. Churches are in an amazingly unique position, but they don't seem to know or appreciate the implications of what it would mean to be free of government control. No minister need fear doing what Mr. Kershaw advocates. The government will not penalize the church for opting out of its 501c3 status because there's no law that requires a church to be a 501c3, nor is this uh, nor is this any kind of tax protest issue. I hope every church leader will read this book and seriously consider the ramifications of what happens to their church when they render unto Caesar what doesn't belong to Caesar. And we all saw that in the Bible. Jesus said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar, and unto the Lord what is the Lord. That is this public and private thing. It's always been going on. It's two sides to everything. There's God's side and then there's man's side. And over here on the public side, everything in the public is a fiction. It is a creation of corporation. And everything on the private side is a creation of God. Hmm. And if and and fear is, is adultery with God. You got to be, see, the thing that most people don't want to talk about the major thing most people don't want to talk about is how everybody turn their backs on God. Because you got an immoral society out here, which makes it very difficult for people to get any kind of remedy because the ultimate remedy is, is for you to obey God's law. Nobody wants to talk about that. You have to have a, a, a long, 
in-depth discussion about the laws of God, whether you want to call them natural law or what, your religion is supposed to be a reflection of God's law. You are supposed to be abiding by that, living honorably in accord with that. And that's what people are not doing. They want what people want to do is they want to act immorally and unlawfully and still have access to some sort of remedy. And the universe doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. The cause and effect doesn't allow it to. Everything, every, everything in the universe operates according to some sort of law. It just is what it is. And you gotta, I mean, you can't get around it. All right. And also the laws are put in place for your benefit. They're not there to oppress you, restrict you from having fun or something like that. They are there for your benefit. You know, if you know the truth, the truth will make you free by coming in. So, you know, I don't mean to get on a thing about uh, religion, but this is just, it is just what it is. You know, they fooling everybody with that. And that's what the Morris Science Temple is attempting to do with the nationality. And that's why I went into this to make people understand it's public and private and where the religion fits in with this and all that. Private, anything on this side of the law is automatically tax exempt. The Moors will try to give you the impression that getting your nationality makes you tax exempt. Anything private is tax exempt. All churches are private and tax exempt. Your, your religion is a private matter. That's why they took prayer out of public school because it doesn't belong in a public school. Your religion is a private matter, not a public matter. Does everybody understand it? Yes, sir. Yeah, so that's that why you said I'm going in courts arguing with them people at the end of the day? Because it's really not worth it. Let's look at the definition of a public figure. What is a public figure? Anybody know what a public figure is? You hear them talk about it on the news all the time, don't you? You ever look public. Let's look up the definition of a public figure. Let's see what a public figure is. Public figure. Why oh, you did that, brother? I got a quick question. Go ahead. How far does the United States go back into this country? I mean, they've been on, they've been putting people in slavery. Well, well, you know, the United States is only like, what, 200 years old? But, you know, you so, but when you go back prior to that, before the formation of, you know, with a federal central government, you know, I mean, what, you know, since, what, the 1700s? So, if that was the case, then, any, any laws that any laws that they try to um, put forth prior to that wouldn't matter if if your family was already here, right? Doesn't matter what. It, listen, let me say this to everybody. Okay, they are dealing in contracts. When the devil wants you to sell your soul, what does he present to you? Fame and fortune. No, he presents a contract to you. All right. Contract makes the law. It doesn't matter. See, this is where everybody gets confused about contract. You got to master contract law. Contract, it don't matter if, if a law hasn't been ratified. It doesn't matter if they're using a fake constitution. It doesn't matter if the judge is not real. If you sign a contract agreeing to it, they're going to enforce the contract. Does everybody understand that? It doesn't matter if your family was here two million years and everything, if one of your idiotic uh, uh, descendants comes along and signs a contract that eradicates all that, the contract is what governs everything. They have a clause in the Constitution that you can't make no law that will infringe upon the obligations of contract. Did everybody know that about the Constitution? I know now. So we're dealing, what did I just show y'all in that public and private thing? It's on pri contract laws on what side? Private, private side. side. 
It's a contract. Okay, they don't, it doesn't matter. The IR, the Internal Revenue Code, the IRS Code, Title 26, they say it wasn't properly ratified. It's not real law. There isn't any law that says we have to do this. It doesn't matter. The IRS is not dealing with that. They're dealing with contracts. It's a contract. Con look that up. That is a maxim of law. Contract makes the law. Let's go to public figure. Right here, here's a public figure. Let's read that. Somebody want to read this for me? Public figure. Somebody read it. A person who has achieved fame or notoriety or who has voluntarily become involved in a public controversy. Let's stop. Okay, y'all know all these people, Young Thug and all that, and Drake and all that fit on this side. Okay, but we have a conjunction right here. Or, or, or who has voluntarily become involved in a public controversy. So when you come in court and start arguing, what have you done? You have stepped it into the public side. You've, you've gone from over here to where? From private to public. Okay. When you file your private documents and register stuff, you took it from over here to where? To public. Okay. Another reason why you don't talk in court and you don't argue. That's called a that's called a uh, 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 a, a traverse. Let's look at the word traverse. When you go in and argue, it is called a traverse. Let's look at the you, Do y'all see? Are y'all getting this? Does anybody is everybody, is everybody riding with me? I'm, I'm not losing nobody, am I? Am I losing anybody? I'm not scaring y'all. I know I got, you know, y'all first time, you know, what I'm, I'm just going I'm just going through these words with you, okay? I, traverse. What is a traverse? Traverse. Here it is. All right. Traverse, common law pleading, a formal denial of a factual allegation made in the opposing party's pleading. So there is what you're doing. When you go in and they say, I didn't do it, or you plead not guilty, you traversed. You just breathed life and you just made the case. And it is said that the technical term traverse from traverto. To turn over is applied to an issue taken up on an indictment for a misdemeanor and means nothing more than turning over or putting off the trial to a following session or a seizy. And that thus it is that the office of the court asks the party whether he is ready to try then or will traverse to the next session. Though some have referred its meaning originally to denying or taking issue upon the indictment. That's what it, without reference to the delay of trial. And this is the one that we're talking about. It is originally denying or taking issue upon the, when you go into issue, issue means what? I have an issue with you. An argument. Argument. And if you argue, that means you have to go to a jury trial or a bench trial. If you want, if you do not want to go to trial, you don't argue. That's why when I come into court and say, I'm the holder in due course, here's the third party intervener making a special appearance as an authorized representative for the defendant. I accept for value and consideration and return for value and consideration all charging instruments in this matter and make my exemption as principal available for discharge of all obligations and charges connected with this case. I do not dispute any of the facts contained in the charging instrument. Please use my exemption for offset and adjustment of the public charges against the defendant and release the order of the court to me immediately. You say something like that. That always frees them up. You say something like that because 
that is everything you need to say. You don't need to say nothing else except have your documentation ready to support it. Now, anybody else want to, uh, any questions? I got to finish this letter. Let's finish the letter. Okay. Yusufa, uh, I want to know um, for each case that we close out, do they take separate GSA forms or can we use a group one uh, uh, GSA form for let's say three I would use separate one. I would use separate one separate because one. you're going to do a separate filings for separate cases. I okay. like so this right here is going to go to one case and then one another. Now I heard Tony King. No, no, no. He, he didn't say that. Yeah, it, it would be separate, man. It's separate cases. Okay, and what about um us monetizing the bonds that we're sending off to them once why we close the cases? Why are you trying to monetize the bond? I mean, for what? Why are you monetizing? Or, or can we? I mean, yeah, you can monetize it if you know how. You'd have to be a private banker, right? You'd have to have the banking certificate. You'd have to have somebody accept it. If you, okay. if you don't have, if it doesn't have a QSIM number or an ISIN number on it, who's going to take it? I got it. That what it is, right. is, it has to be. It has to be what's called verified. If somebody else is going to take, if you're going to monetize it, what you're asking is for somebody to take it. See, this is the question I asked somebody on my YouTube page. They were trying to say, "Well, I'm calling you out. You know, you're supposed to be able to take bills of exchange for payment for your webinars and stuff like." That. I said, "I can't monetize the instrument. What, what are you saying? I mean, you know, if I can convert that instrument into another form of payment, because when I go up to um, public and have to buy some groceries, they're not going to take an international bill of exchange or something like that. You know, they could if they wanted to, but that's their decision because that's what private people do. On the private side, there is any requirement for anybody on the private side to take anything. That's why you discharge public debts. Public debts that are able to be discharged, not private matters. Can you borrow against it? You can do anything you want if somebody will take it. Um, Who are you going to get to take it? Um, IMF? If they'll take it. I mean, it's private. When you're doing private, when you're doing stuff on the private side, it's contract based. So it's all about the agreement of the parties. They agree to take it, yeah. If they don't want to take it, they don't have to take it. That's the yeah. private side. So you got a lot of people out there trying to monetize instruments and stuff like that, monetize a birth certificate, things like that. But if you want to play on that field, you got to I, I put up just a just a just a segue in what I'm telling you, because it sounds like you knew, too. I put up a uh, a whole link on monetizing instruments on my website. OK. Right here. It's called platform trading. All you gotta do is read this right here. These people right here tell you about private placement programs, cash holding. This talk, this talk, this right here is telling about how monetize an instrument, the game that you're trying to play. And this right here is invest. This, this right here goes into it. And you have to be invited. This is talking about on the DTC level though. But a lot of people they have instruments that are not registered through the Securities and Exchange that Rule 144A which is for private instruments. But once again, it only deals with, if you're dealing with um, pri other private individuals, it's all based off where they want to take your instrument. When you come, uh, you won't know the number of people coming to me. I got a bond for $2 trillion. Okay, it don't matter if it's for $2 trillion. Is it verified? In other words, is there collateral supporting it or some sort of asset backing it? If it's not, then what you're asking people to do is just accept it. See, what people are doing in the secure party method, their labor is the asset that is that is um, backing uh, that is backing the uh, uh, the um, the birth certificate. But the thing about it is, is they have no way of guaranteeing your labor. That is why they arrest you. 
all right, because when they arrest you and they hold your body, they guarantee in your labor because they're gonna make you labor, they're gonna make you work for them. Does that make sense? So they can write a bond against you and sell your labor because they got you in custody. They guarantee and they're gonna get some labor out of you. You're gonna pay your debt to society because you're gonna work for us. How do you know um once the debt the, is discharged, will they be contacting you or sending you something back in the mail? You think they're gonna send you? Do you really think? Let me ask you a common sense question. Do you think they're gonna send you something saying thank you for your payment? That how do you know it's, it's been discharged? It's gonna disappear, ain't it? Or they gonna the only way you would, the or way you would go to jail. It could be a number of different things. Did you read the document called Creditors and Their Bonds? Have you read that document? Yeah, I read it. It's just been a minute. Okay, what did it say in that document when you report and uh, that you have to plead guilty and the reason that you're pleading guilty? I don't remember. It's been a minute. Oh, yeah, it's been a minute. Okay. Well, you know, I, I read it. I still remember it. Let's let's go back and look at it. All right. Right here, when you go to PDF files, right here, we got what is creditors and their bonds. Thank the individual who retyped creditors and their bonds. Somebody actually retyped this and whole document for me. What? Yeah, and may updated it for me. I right. and right here you will see. Well, let me go to the uh, letter of rogatory. This is your letter to the attorney right here. All right. Well, you're instructing him what to do for you. Okay. Right. Yeah, right here. All right. This is your letter to the attorney. All right. I want you to request an appearance bond at no cost to me so I can be released on my own recognizance. When the bond has been issued, I will enter a plea of guilty to the facts for the defendant. I will not dispute any of the facts in this matter, but I do not agree to be held personally liable with no protection. Now, you're pleading guilty to the facts of the case, which means you're not arguing to anything. But just because you're guilty of something doesn't mean that you violated one of their statutes. See, what they're trying to do is they're trying to pull you under their statutes. And what you're telling them is, I'm not going to argue with you about anything. I'm going to go ahead and pay for it and then eliminate and eliminate this. We don't have to go in any type of criminal proceeding or anything because it's civil. They get you into contempt first civilly, and then they charge you criminally for refusing to pay for the debt. So you may have to plead guilty, and that appears, but in this document, it tells you that's for the public show. I've actually done this myself. They let me go. But the record is going to show I play a guilty. But they let me go. And the attorney will tell you, look, ain't no probation, ain't no nothing, just plead guilty. See, y'all be caught up with wanting to be innocent and guilty and your record and all that kind of stuff. The thing about it is, is this, and this is what most people, this is what most people can't grasp and most people can't deal with about operating in commerce and operating privately. You supposed to be private. You ain't supposed to be working no job. You don't care about having no record because you ain't supposed to be working no job. You ain't supposed to be doing nothing in the public. You ain't supposed to have no social security number. You doing none of that stuff. You supposed to be operating your businesses through some sort of entity. You supposed to be effectively invisible to the system. Your house shouldn't be in no social security number, not your car. Not your children. Your children should be homeschooled. That's really when you look at the Amish. Those are the people that's doing it right. But see, what people are doing with this is they trying to ride the fence. You trying to be private and then operate in the public too. That's why you getting screwed up. Houston, man, I done had a couple of people just had their their, um, their children, right? 
and explaining, trying to explain that to them. First thing to come out of their mouth is health care, what have they need, health care and all this other stuff. Hey, welfare recipients. I, I know, man, but it's, it's the mind. It's no, the welfare. mind. They welfare. What, what you do is you show them this right here. Just go to some welfare state. <laughs> all right? Just go to this right here and read this right here to them. Welfare state, a system. The government undertakes to protect the health and well-being of its citizens especially those in financial or social need by means of grants, pensions, and other benefits. The foundations for the modern welfare state in the United States were laid by the New Deal program of Franklin, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So that is what he, that's when Social Security came into effect. That was the Great Depression. That was the American people couldn't take care of themselves. So when you can't take care of yourself, you're not a free and independent. You're not independent. you dependent. Not depending on what's in the God in you, you are dependent, and as such, you are a ward of the state. So, well, if you want to talk about privacy, I you got to be private. You can't be half doing something and thinking you're going to be afforded any type of remedy. And I'll show you where a judge says that. Where is that? Um, that judge said that he said that in um. Oh, yeah. Let me show you where this judge said this at. And when I post this stuff, I post this on my Facebook page, but people, I don't think people really understand, you know, the significance of some of the stuff I I I I I, I post. And you know, and these are these are judges making statements, very powerful statements, and it's going over people's heads. You know, it's like and people don't really see what these people tell you. They tell you a lot of things all the time. But uh, if you go into this document, nature of the remedy. It's either in this one or that uh, other one. I mean, I think it's in this one. Let's see, is it this one? No, it's not in this one. It's uh, it's zero out your count. Zero out your count. Uh. Right here. This judge said this. All right, right here. This is what the judge said in Great Falls versus the court said, the court will not pass upon a constitutionality of a statute at the instance of one who has availed himself of his benefits. So you can't challenge you can't do a constitutional challenge of a statute if you have been using it. If you've been availing yourself of benefits, you cannot challenge anything. You're not under no constitutional protections. You're in the contract, right? You're in a contract. And contracts are express or implied. And it's based on implied contracts are based off your conduct. And judges will tell you actions speak louder than words. Your intentions can be derived from your conduct. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this for y'all. I'm going to do a part two to this because it's 1214. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do a part two tomorrow. Do y'all want to do this tomorrow night or Saturday morning? Tomorrow night. Everybody, if everybody vote on it. Tomorrow, tomorrow night. night. Tomorrow. All right, tomorrow night, I'm going to do part two of this. All right? And let me give y'all the link right now. Hold on. I'm going to give y'all the link right now. So everybody's on here going to get a link. So let me give you a link right now. Because we'll be going all night, but I want to finish this letter and we'll do it. It's going to be tomorrow at 
I'm going to do it a little earlier tomorrow at 8 a.m. Cool. I mean, 8 p.m. Okay. Yes, it is. One quick question, brother, real quick before you go. All right. Just hit you up. Just hit you up in the email about the um uh, the IRS uh codes. Yeah, the uh, uh the, uh, the uh, yeah the decoding manual. And uh, I, and Michelle, I know I got to send you a copy. Uh, so I got you. But yeah, but the decoding manual. Uh, yeah, I got that. Uh, just hit me up in the email. You get a copy. Sixty two oh nine decoding manual. There it is, right there. That is the information for tomorrow. Okay. Where is it at? It's in your chat. Look in the chat. Look in the chat. Scroll all the way down to the chat. You can copy that somewhere. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Are you, sir? Go ahead. You, sir? I'm here. I'm listening. Oh, yeah. Uh, I have all my docs ready for a uh, review. Um, let's see. My uh, trial is March 29th, 9 o'clock, so I have plenty of time still to get them in. Since, okay. Um, okay, I tell you yeah. what, let's let's do it. Let's do it tomorrow in the morning at ten o'clock. Okay. 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 Sounds good. All right, y'all. That's it for me.